Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the October 2nd, uh, the October 2nd, excuse me. I'd like to call the October 2nd meeting of the Town of Arlington uh, Redevelopment Board to, uh, to order. My name is Rachel Zenberry. I'm the chair. I am not in control of the mic. Um, I'd like the other members of the board to please introduce themselves. Steve Revelock. Jin Lau. Eugene Benson. And we also have with us this evening the uh, director of the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development, Claire Ricker. So let's go ahead to our first agenda item, which is the review of meeting minutes. Uh, the first set of meeting minutes that we have are the November 11th, 2023 meeting minutes. And I will see if there are any additions or corrections for the board, starting with Steve. Uh, no changes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ken? None for me. Jean? No changes. And I have no changes either. Is there a motion to approve the no uh, September 11th, 2023 meeting minutes as submitted? So motion. Second. We'll take a vote starting with Steve. Yes. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Those meeting minutes have been approved. We'll now move to the September 18th, 2023 meeting minutes. Again, uh, any additions or corrections, starting with Steve? Uh, nothing here, Madam Chair. Ken? None for me. Jean? No changes. And I have none either. Is there a motion to approve the September 18th meeting minutes as submitted? So motion. Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Steve. Yes. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Those have been approved. That closes agenda item number one. We'll now move to agenda item number two, uh, two, the third night of the hearing for the Warren Articles for Fall 2023 Special Town Meeting. This evening is uh, reserved for the deliberation of the board and a vote on whether to recommend action or no action on the articles which are before us as per the agenda. We will move first to the uh, to Article 12, the MBTA Communities Overlay District. And I will hand it over to Claire to uh, run through the, uh, the revisions that have been incorporated into the document, uh, the documents that have been posted and the additional study items uh, that were prepared by UTL. Great, thank you. Um, the, de the Department of Planning and uh, Community Development the MBTA Communities Working Group and UTIL, our consultant, are returning tonight with the information requested by the board at their meeting on September the 11th. What you will see tonight are nine different scenarios and two alternatives for the district, most of which are related to maximum height and parking requirements, although there are three alternatives that would change the overall shape of the district, two of which are alternatives for Arlington Heights and two in East Arlington that were proposed for study by this board on 9-11. So I'm going to run through the various scenarios and then look at and discuss uh, the decision points for this, for this board this evening. Alternative one stretches from East Arlington to the Lexington town line. This alternative avoids the future zoning study area for an Arlington Heights business district. Alternative one and alternative two avoid all commercial and industrial parcels and limit the depth of the neighborhood multifamily district to approximately 150 feet from the main thoroughfares on Mass Ave and Broadway in East Arlington, allowing for a one to two parcel transitional height area of four stories into the R1 and R2 districts. While Arlington Heights, in order to maintain the future zoning study area for the business district, the overall depth of the neighborhood multifamily district from the center line of Mass Ave is 350 feet. The model outputs for alternative one are the district area is approximately 109 acres with a capacity for 7,268 units at a density of 67 dwelling units per acre with a parking maximum of one space per unit. Alternative two in East Arlington is the same as alternative one. However, in Arlington Heights, we don't zone to the town line. Rather, we extend the neighborhood multifamily district to the north of Mass Ave. And we include Grove Street and the Forest Clark Pierce Street area. This is a more uh, granular and zoomed in look. The model outputs for alternative two are slightly different from alternative one with a district area of 115 
uh, about 115 acres at a capacity of 7,391 units and a density of 65 units, dwelling units per acre, again with a parking maximum of one space per unit. Here is a comparison of those two alternatives for compliance with the MBTA communities. October 2nd, this evening's scenario um, for discussion and deliberation. Again, at the meeting on 9-11, this board asked the Department of Planning and Community Development and the working group to go back and model the following alternatives as on the slide. Model the neighborhood multifamily zone with a three-story height maximum instead of four. Model a minimum parking requirement of one space per unit instead of a parking maximum requirement of one space per unit. Model a zone that eliminates the proposed overlay east of Orvis Road directly on Mass Ave, but retrains the neighborhood multifamily area to maintain contiguity. Model a zone that eliminated all proposed overlay parcels east of Orvis Road along Mass Ave, including the neighborhood multifamily area. Scenario one, um, three stories in the neighborhood multifamily um, district. This simply changes the height maximum from four to three stories in the overlay area and, with, uh, and we end up with a district area, again, of 115 acres with a capacity for 6,330 units at a density of roughly 55 units per acre. The next scenario is three stories across the neighborhood multifamily zone with one uh, parking space, uh, one minimum parking space per unit. So we stay at three stories and we add the minimum of one space per unit. We model the district again at 115 acres with a capacity of 3,351 units at a density of roughly 29 units an acre. In this scenario, we are modeling four stories with the one space parking minimum. With four stories across the neighborhood multifamily and a parking minimum of one space per unit, Again, the district area is 115 acres with a capacity of 3,939 units at a density of roughly 34 units per acre. All right, scenario 3A, to remove all the parcels on Mass Ave east of Orvis Road while keeping neighborhood monthly family with a maximum height of four stories. By removing the parcels along Mass Ave east of Orvis Road in anticipation of a future ARB zoning study and leaving enough of the neighborhood multifamily zone to maintain contiguity, we model a district acre, about 130, uh, excuse me, 113 um, acres with a capacity of 7,137 units at a density of roughly 64 units per acre. This scenario models moving from four stories to three in the neighborhood multifamily zone with removing the parcels from Mass Ave east of Orvis. By removing these parcels, we end up, oh, uh, to maintain contiguity and requiring a maximum height of three stories instead of four, we model a district area of 113 acres at a capacity of 6,012 units and a density of roughly 54 units an acre. Scenario three, we move from four stories to three in the neighborhood multifamily, remove Mass Ave parcels, and add one space, one parking space per unit minimum. By removing the parcels along Mass Ave east of Orvis Road in anticipation of a future ARB zoning study and leaving enough of the neighborhood multifamily zone to maintain contiguity and requiring a maximum height of three stories instead of four and requiring a minimum of one parking space per unit, we model a district of roughly 113 acres at a capacity of 3,184 units and a density of 28 and a half units per acre. Scenario B is to remove all parcels proposed east of or Orvis Road. All right, we remove all parcels east of Orvis Road. The height maximum stays at four stories in the neighborhood multifamily area. By removing these parcels, um, along uh, Mass Ave east of uh, Orvis Road in anticipation of a future ARB zoning uh, study. We model this district total um, at roughly 104 acres with a capacity of 6,570 units at 64.1 units per acre density. Scenario 3B2, remove all parcels east of Orvis Road with a height maximum moves from four stories to three stories. By removing the parcels along Mass Ave east of Orvis Road 
Uh, in anticipation of a future AR rezoning study, we model a district area of 104 acres with a capacity of 5,594 units at 54.6 units per acre. Scenario 3B3, remove all parcels east of Orvis Road. Height maximum is at three stories instead of four with one parking space per unit minimum. The district area totals 104 acres with 2,966 unit capacity and a density of 29 units per acre. Historic properties. Here is a map of historic properties in the zone that are currently many, most of which, which are currently clustered across Mass Ave from the high school, but are necessary to include as a matter of contiguity as the parcels that front Mass Ave um, in this area are commercially zoned. This chart tells us how many historic properties are in the zone and their level of distinction. Remember that some are um, identified um, in, at three different levels, National Register, uh, State, um, MACRIS Inventory, um, and Local Inventory. Um, this chart tells us how many properties are in the zone and their level of distinction. Remember that historic properties will continue to be subject to design review, demolition delay, and that MBTA communities overlay does not include historic districts. So for our compliance check, and we can leave this slide up for reference. Um, it's basically a summary of everything I just went over. Uh, district size, capacity, and district density. Decision points for um, this evening. Three or four stories in the mul neighborhood multifamily. Orvis Road eliminates some or all parcels to the east in preparation for future study. Alternative one which zones neighborhood multifamily to the Lexington town line along Paul Revere Road. Alternative two, which flips that neighborhood multifamily to the north of Mass Ave along Grove Street and Forest Clark and Pierce area. Also for consideration tonight are parking requirements and um, inclusion or disinclusion of historic properties. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I'm happy to leave that slide up for discussion. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Claire. Um, You're welcome. Jean, if you could, at this point, uh, run through the um, alterations that you uh, were able to make to the draft amendment, uh, that would be helpful, and then uh, we'll open it up for the board discussion. Yeah, as, as a result of our last Sean, would you, just one second, Sean, would you please be able to um, raise the volume on the microphones? Thank you. Thank you. As a result yeah. of our previous meeting, I made, I did amendments to the warrant article 12 main motion. I'll just go through them briefly. I added four definitions, a definition of as of right development, which I pretty much took directly from the MBTA community's guidance. A definition of multifamily housing, which I took pretty much directly from the MBTA community's guidance. A definition of overlay district, which is an amalgam of a few different definitions in various places that is consistent with what's proposed for the MBTA overlay district, and a definition of site plan review, which is a combination of the definition in the compliance guidance plus the additional discussion in the compliance guidance about site plan review. I removed the definition of executive office of living and whatever it's called these days as unnecessary um, in the district regulations part, um, I did some rewording. The s one substantive change I added is at the end of 5.9.1b, the sentence that says, um, I'm sorry, 5.9.1c, which says if a proposed development is located on a parcel or parcels only partially within the MBMF or MNF overlay districts, the provisions of the existing underlying zoning shall apply. So for example, if there was a parcel in the um, neighborhood district 
and somebody added two other parcels to it, so it went all the way down the street. The question is, should it then be subject to the overlay district, or should it be subject to the underlying district? We can change that. I figured I needed to put something in for the discussion, and I thought the better way to look at it was it should um, be subject to the underlying zoning, not the overlay district. Um, and there were some other wording changes I made, 5.9.1, but no substantive change. Um, in uh, 5.9.3, I rewrote and made some editorial changes to site plan review, but no substantive changes. I didn't make um, any changes to the development standards other than some slight rewording. Um, in the um, bonuses area, um, I did not make any changes either. And I rewrote the affordable housing section completely to do what I thought the board intended to do, or the working group intended to do, which would be um, have the requirements the same as currently exist in the bylaw with the proviso that until they are approved by um, EOHLC, the EOHLC standard applies, which is required by the guidance. I didn't change um, the part in the bonuses about the um, bonuses for more units. I just clarified what the percentages were. So those are the changes to the previous version to this version. Great. Thank you, Jean. Um, so we have a number of items that we had identified that we need to uh, run through this evening to ensure that we come to consensus from the, from the board on uh, the, the open items from the September 11th hearing. And so um, I'd like to start by uh, Jean having you run through the items uh, that you would like to put on the table for discussion this evening. Um, I'll run through each of the board members and then we will uh, take those one by one. Actually printed. So we will read this out to ensure that um, Thank you. this is part of the record. Jean, you, you, your intent is to read through this, correct? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, I, I have so many that I thought it made sense to print them out so everybody could see them with me. Um, so Article 12, the th three issues that Rachel and I had discussed previously were reducing the neighborhood district maximum height to three stories, um, applying the current off-street parking requirements of Section 6.1 to the MBT MBTA overlay rather than the proposed no minimum one max and the other proposed changes. And Jean, just before you go, uh, that includes the uh, potential for parking reduction per it's for, those, correct? Right. Okay, great. And so we could reduce them uh, with the transportation demand management plan. For 6.1.5. Right. right. And um, excluding Mass Ave from Orvis to L. Weifbrook Parkway from the overlay as is one of the scenarios which were discussed. Um, here are the other suggestions. Um, adding a street trees requirement, which we said would be in this but isn't currently in it. I think the easiest way to do that is to make it subject to the zoning bylaw section 6.3, which we intend to um, ask the town meeting to amend uh, to include residences. Adding the solar roof requirements, I think only for the uh, Massachusetts Avenue and Broadway multifamily district. Make those subject to the zoning bylaw section 6.4. Um, we need to do something with signs because um, the sign bylaw applies to either business districts or um, residential districts. 
And the way this overlay is written, it's neither a business district nor a residential district. So we therefore have to apply the sign bylaw. And my suggestion is for the neighborhood multifamily district to apply the residential sign district requirements for residential in the um, Massachusetts and Broadway multifamily district to apply the residential slash business sign district and for those buildings that use the bonus to create mixed use, they would get the business sign district requirements. Next, which we discussed a few weeks ago, is changing what's currently site certifiable to sites gold or better certified or other standard the ARB may adopt in its rules and regulations. Um, David Morgan, in his memo, suggested gold certifiable but I think some of us think certifiable is too loose to work with and not enough to get an extra floor. Um, to the purpose statements, adding one other purpose uh, to encourage environmental and climate protection sensitive development. Um, I removed some um, duplicate requirements. I would remove some duplicate requirements and those that don't seem to make a lot of sense in context. For example, in um, 5.9.5e, E5, sorry, E4, it talks about height width bonuses cannot exceed four stories in the NMF district, but there are no bonuses in the MMS district. So it really doesn't make sense to keep, keep that in there. Um, another change is if you look at 5.9.410, it's almost exactly the same as the chart in 12 and the bonuses. So I would get rid of it except to move the sentence that says minimum required front setback areas shall be available for uses such as trees, landscaping, benches, tables, chairs, play areas, or similar features to um, a note on the district chart. Um, next, adding some additional requirements for ground floor first level to qualify for no front yard setback and extra stories height. Some of you may have seen the letter we got late today from the um, Chamber of Commerce, suggesting that 68% is too low a 60%. percentage. 60%? Yeah, thank yeah. you. And they didn't suggest a percentage, and I don't know what it could be. The other ones I would suggest, in order to get the front yard, no front yard setback and extra stories of height, is no residences on the first floor. And the other is it must be retail, restaurant, um, not because I don't see why we would give away a setback for offices, for example. So when you think about how we want to activate the streetscape and the pedestrians, they're for retail, they're for restaurant, mm -hmm. maybe for some service businesses, but not for office. So I think we need to do something about that. Um, I, think, I think we need to rethink what to do with a parcel partially in the MBMF and partially in the NMF. Um, right now it says when it's in both, the, NM, the MBMF applies. But you can think of a scenario where there's a parcel in, let's say on Mass Ave, and they combine it for a few parcels going down the side street, and under this they could then build six-story buildings going down the side street, and I don't think that was the intention. So I would flip this around and say if it's partially in the MBMF and partially in the NMF, the NMF rather than the MBMF applies. Um, then there are some wording changes. So for example, in the, in the chart uh, for um, height, front setback, real setback, or setback, we need to add minimum to the setback numbers, because right now it does, it's not clear if they're max, minimum, or whatever. We should probably put the word yard in. And then there was um, 
a suggestion we got from one of the comments that said for the side setbacks, maybe what we want to do instead is say one side minimum five feet and two sides minimum 20 feet to give a little bit more flexibility for that. On step backs, which is now in 5.9.4 D7, I would remove that and just do a subject to the setbacks that now exist. We're going to make some changes to those, but I think it doesn't make any sense to me to have different setbacks for those within and outside the overlay since the buildings might be right next to each other on Mass Ave or Broadway. Um, 5.9.4 D5, this, um, which is the traffic visibility across street corners. Um, it, right now it does not apply in the MB, it does not apply at all if you read the details because it's in residential districts and there are no residential districts in the overlay if you rely on the overlay. So I would rewrite it instead to say traffic visibility across street corners applies in the NMF districts rather than how it's written. Um, for then in 5.9.3, I just we just need to capitalize the word section and add uh, 5.9. I forgot to do that when I rewrote that part. The height buffer area. Um, so right now, we don't technically need this here because the height buffer area does not apply to anything in the overlay district because the height buffer area only applies when you look at the tables and there are two different heights, but there are no two different heights in the tables in the overlay district, so it doesn't apply. However, I think it should apply. I think it should apply until we decide what we want to do with the um, height buffer area and go to town meeting and see if they agree because it does serve a purpose. I think all of us think it needs to be amended, but I don't want to do away with it at all. Um, what else do I have? That's it. That's a lot, but that's what I have. Great. Thank you, Jean. Um, before we go further, I would just like for some, some clarification from Claire and perhaps the working group. Mm -hmm. um, Jean made a couple of references to the fact that the um, business and residential districts um, are, are replaced by this overlay district. My understanding from reading this is that it doesn't replace it, but they are sup these are superimposed over it, and the business and residential requirements still remain. So some of the items that you were just referring to as needing to um, add back add back in, my understanding would, would still apply because they are still in the underlying zoning. Am I that's misinterpreting not, what you're saying, Jean? That's not how I read this. Okay. The way I read it was this overlay district goes over the residential and business, and you have a choice of either complying with the rules of the underlying residential or zoning district or complying with the rules of the overlay. That's what this said initially. So when I made some minor wording changes, I did not change the substance. So it still says you apply, you can comply with either. So that means that if you choose to comply with the overlay, you don't comply with anything that's specifically for the residential and business. So for example, a lot of um, Five point, a lot of 5.3.1, I think, says in any district. So those apply to any district. So if you look at the zoning bylaw. Before, before we go too deep, can I ask the members of the working group, is, was that the intent or was the intent that the underlying zoning applies unless altered by the overlay? 
The my recollection, Madam Chair, was that the underlying it was a pick one or the other. So where the overlay is silent, we need to make sure that the overlay is not silent on any of these items. So can, I can say, so there are some parts of the bylaw currently that apply to everything. So for example, 5.2.1 yep. says all districts, this is how it works. But then there are other parts that only apply to residential, other parts that only apply Understood, understood. Well, I, if I maybe, I was too simple in my answer. So in, I, I think in uh, members of the working group, if uh, I'll look at you, <laughs> um, was that the, you know, in the case of where the overlay had one set of rules and the, um, and the underlying district had a different set of rules, dimensional tables, for example, then it would be picking one or the other. Um, but, you know. It would, it would be, if you are, it would be the overlay district, again, if you are, Correct. Looking to create multifamily housing. Correct. But for example, if um, f for things that, you know, f for things that um, are not, there would. For things like signage, for example. For things like silent, signage, yeah. We would not need to specifically or apply that standards. because, again, this does not replace the existing zoning. Right. It is superimposed Correct. over top of it. So that was the intent. That's not, well, that might have been the intent, but that's not how it reads. We should talk about that. that I'm going to put that on the list because yeah. I read that, that it, I'm reading and, that it reads that and, way right and, now. And let's say that that's the way it reads. Let's use signs as an example. The underlying district in all of these is residential. So if you put a six-story multi-use, I don't think you want to use the residential sign rules. Mm -hmm. Understood. Right? So, yep. yeah. Um, can I say something? Yes. I agree with Steve and probably Rachel that the intent of uh, uh, the working group was that um, this is just simply makes it as a right and not as a special permit to, to build these projects. And so it just made it easier to build more residential. If this um, overlay is silent, uh, example signage and whatever, then underlying um, rules still apply. And that's, we, we never was there to in, enforce or change um, signage or um, egress or a, a, anything like that. It just made it uh, more convenient in, in encouraged housing uh, that way there. It, uh, you know, we got into this other affordable stuff and this other stuff as a byproduct of what people wanted in town. But the underlying thing when we first started was to make it easier to develop housing in this community. And that's, and that's how, how I interpret it. And um, so, you know, I think I'm saying the same thing just yeah. saying, Steve. Yeah, I mean, where we try, I think in, in terms of drafting, the goal was to be very specific about what did not apply. Right. Um, and, and most, most, most of the things in development standards that you say did not apply, with one or two exceptions, are the ones that apply regardless of the districts it's in. So it remains, I don't think it's ambiguous, but apparently it is ambiguous as to whether the underlying applies unless it's changed by this, mm -hmm. or whether if you choose the overlay, you don't deal with the underlying at all. And, and it does present some other problems because there are some things that we want to apply, such as, I'd say, um, street trees, solar, things like that, that aren't necessarily in those districts but only happen, or parking where we can change it when it's subject to environmental design review. So, so it I think, becomes I think, pretty complicated to figure out what to do if the underlying applies unless it's modified by 
the overlay, it's a lot easier if you say, if it's in the overlay, the underlying doesn't apply. And then we just add in the things that we mm -hmm. want to apply. So I, I, I see somebody shaking his head over there. Yeah. So that's not how I was reading and that's not how I've been <laughs> looking at this. And I, I think it's pretty clear in that it, um, when it, in section 5.9.1B, where it talks about it not replacing the underlying districts, but in superimposing that these items, um, again, where it's silent, we need to apply the standards that are currently in the bylaws. We, we can run through and see how many of those. Well, we can certainly put something in 5.9.1 to clarify. I think, I think we need to. I mean, yes, if we're, I we if we're to confused, too. then we, we absolutely right. need to do that. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so that's but, Jean's list. But what we put in is saying that the underlying uh, regulations stay unless it is, it is changed. That's what by we need to talk about. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm just making a list oh. of all the different things. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you're right. That's what we need to. Um, that's what we'll need to discuss this evening. Okay. Um, so, Ken, did you have other items on your list? Um, I did talk. I want to talk about one thing, which is the how we turned the corner on this uh, on the setbacks, mm -hmm. not necessarily. The, um, um, no, sorry. How we turn the corner on the on the step backs, not the setbacks. Okay. All right, and uh, something we had talked about before, so I like to put that on on the on the table to talk about um, how that. When sorry, you, setbacks or step backs? Step. Uh, step. Step backs. Okay. Uh, step backs. Yep. So when you turn the corner, you might have a six-story building, and if yep. you turn the corner into a more residential street, it would step back. To, be, to blend in more with uh, um, yep. on side streets. Uh, I like to put that on, and then a couple of things that I like to talk about with Gene, but you want to table that till going over some of that? Cause he, yes, we'll go through each one of these point by point. Okay, um, that's all I okay. want to add. Gene had a pretty good list here. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, any other points that you'd like to put on the table? For uh, yes, uh, for bonuses, yep. um, subsection E1. We, an earlier version of this, I believe, um, set the. It said that the allow, set of allowed commercial uses for ground floor commercial would be B2, and I'm not seeing any. I'm not seeing that mentioned in this revision. So I, I think we have to say which. Commercial uses are allowed on the ground floor. Which is sort of what I said. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's similar to what Jean was suggesting that yeah. we should be explicit as to mm -hmm. preferred commercial uses. Right. Yeah, because if, Steve, if you look at it, it says business uses, and that was the exact language in the previous mm -hmm. version, which I felt was too loosey-goosey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was thinking, I, I, I th there was an earlier re revision that was, um, I, I think it was use is allowed in B2, but, you know, we can, we can, go, we can come back to that. Um, in E2, I believe there's a word missing. Uh, so the second to last line, second additional may be added. I, I think the word story should be after additional. Right. Um, I'm sorry, which, uh, E2? E2, correct. And in uh, section F, um, this is going to hinge upon parking, but I think F1 and F4, it doesn't make sense to have, it, those right. it should be one or the other and not both. Right. Um, and we'll have to iron that out. And uh, that is, everything else I believe has been mentioned. So um, I'll, I'll wrap up there. Great. Uh, so we talked about parking reductions. Uh, question I had under purposes was whether B and D were the same intent and we should combine those together. B and E, you mean? B and D. B and D. Under 5.9.2.
have been on the list. And yeah. let's see. Uh, you talked about uh, 6.4 in the zoning bylaw, ensuring that the solar bylaw applies. And I have some uh, suggested wording for adding more teeth to the uh, uh, green um, development. Uh, the size. Bon yeah, the bonus. Yeah. Which option. I did too. Okay, great. All right. Uh, any others before we start running through these? All right. Let's start with the uh, top of the list. Uh, I think we're going to go from large um, concepts down to more details, which is great. That's Probably a great place to start. So let's start with uh, reducing the neighborhood multifamily um, requirements max height from four to three stories. That was uh, put on the table by um, Jean. I'm personally in favor of reducing the height from um, architecturally in terms of the, the context of the existing communities um, and uh, what, I, what I think um, again, what, what we've been hearing from the public, mm -hmm. but um, Steve and Ken, interested in your thoughts. Um, you first, Ken. Thank you. Um, I think when we, we had talked about this a lot in our working group, and we said that uh, the majority of the neighborhoods are two and a half stories right now. So introducing a uh, maximum height of three stories is not enough of an incentive to uh, uh, increase the housing. So I think having the fourth story is what makes the difference. Otherwise, um, this will just become uh, a non-starter, saying if someone's going to buy a property that already has two and a half stories, they're just going to renovate it. The cost of adding that uh, half, half story is not enough to um, uh, develop it into a full increased uh, number of units. They're just going to renovate it. They're not going to add units. And so we, I think we settled on uh, four stories as, as a requirement. And if you do, if you do look at uh, there's some areas, there are four-story buildings adjacent to uh, in the neighborhoods. I'm not saying a lot because uh, the zoning over the, over the last few years has actually discourage that and we're trying to change it. That's what we're doing here now. And so I think uh, it can be done and not, I'm not saying let's put a six story building there, but a four story to two and a half story building is, is I think is, uh, is reasonable. And that's, that's what the working group felt. Okay. Steve? So yeah, I've, I went back and forth on this one for a, for a while. A lot. I've been thinking about this one a lot. Um, originally, my thought was, you know, it would be nice to have more buildings with elevators. And I, I, I see that now that it's a little more complicated than we had originally assumed. And there are a whole bunch of factors in play. Um, I get my personal feeling is that although I like the idea of four-story buildings. I think there would be more people who would feel comfortable with this if it were three. And in terms of you know, recalling my days on the Zoning Board of Appeals, there are a lot, I, I think the utility of going, there is utility in, give, in giving people the option to go from a two and a half to uh, a three. There's, you know, we certainly have enough dormer requests and, you know, they do what they can short of a third story and um, I, I, I'm okay, I'm okay with uh, a three story in the neighborhood multifamily. Great, thanks Steve. Um, can I, I certainly hear what you're saying. I think my feeling is um, that there is to, to Steve's point in terms of the adaption of a two and a half story to a three story building and making, giving that an incentive to renovate into, from a two family into a mm -hmm. three or, or, you know, potentially four family, but most likely a three family is part of the intent of this is to have multifamily at many different scales and um, three family certainly seems to 
fit into the um, existing fabric of many mm -hmm. of those neighborhoods very, very seamlessly. That's where I'm coming from. Yeah, I'll, I, I mean, I Gene. agree with Steve and Rachel. I'll just add a couple of points. The compliance guideline itself says that the district should encourage the development of multifamily housing projects of a scale, density, and aesthetic that are compatible with existing surrounding uses. And, and you know, I walked some of the streets, not all of them, but quite a few of the streets that just go off Mass Ave and Broadway to see what they look like and what's there. And, and, and you know, mostly it's two, two and a half, and three-story buildings. And I think the three-story, which if, if the overlay district um, doesn't replace everything else, really allows three and a half story, just the way two allows two and a half story, um, you get something that's in line with you know, the um, scale, density, aesthetic that's there already. I, I'll point out that um, there was some discussion a, a while ago about whether four story would be much preferable because it requires an elevator. And I did a lot of research and my research turned up that the rules for elevators are the same for three-story buildings as four-story buildings, which basically is if you can have all the ac accessible pieces, you know, apartment, entrance, things like that, on the accessible ground floor, you don't need an elevator. Realistically, as buildings get taller, people are going to want to put in elevators because, you know, people don't want to look, walk up a lot of stairs. But the rules are the same for three and four story buildings as far as elevators. So I think that for the reasons you stated and also for many, many, many of the comments that we've gotten about this and the consideration of the changes in elevation, not in East Arlington so much as, as the center and west of the center. I just think three is a much better place to be than four. So in terms of coming to, um, to a uh, consensus on, on this, um, can it looks like you know three three of us are are, are leaning towards towards three. Is that something that you can get behind? At, the, at this point in time, I want to ask: Does this affect the one-story bonus for affordable? So you're saying three stories with the standard, and then there's, that's the maximum height you can go. The the bonus the is the bonus right. isn't available in the neighborhood district, so it has no impact on just. I'm just asking right now because yeah, we're reducing it from four to three. So o o only in the neighborhood district. I realize that. Yeah. But now we're saying I'm asking if we were to do a more affordable units would the four story come back. Would you guys get behind I that? I'm just trying to get a compromise here. Yeah. There, but there's no four story building. There's no bonus. No, Gene, in the neighborhood Gene, Gene I said if, if I were to say if I ever get behind reducing it to three stories on the neighborhood communities, okay? Can we introduce then a bonus for having a more affordable units by adding the fourth story in that neighborhood, in the neighborhood business, just like we've done elsewhere? And would you guys get behind that? I'm just trying to reach a compromise here because I really think introducing, not reducing down three stories, you're not gonna, incre you're not gonna induce or encourage that much more growth. And if, if it's not about encouraging growth, then uh, I think you got the mark right there. That's what I'm trying to say. So I, I personally think that, again, from what we've seen in terms of um, properties that are in a two-family district that are not two families, uh, when they are available for redevelopment, um, the the new owner taking the opportunity to add the additional unit that I, I feel confident based on that history that we will see additional units and number of, number of units created by allowing for multifamily and three stories in this district. Okay. 
that's my point of view, Gene. I agree. I, I agree as well. I'm probably not going to get behind this. Okay, that's okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay, so um, the right now we are looking towards uh, reducing the max height to three stories. The uh, apply the current off street parking requirements of 6.1, including parking reductions as 6.1.5 instead of parking maximums. Uh, so that was put forth by uh, Jean. Uh, Ken, do you want to respond to that one? Um, essentially, this is just changing a, a maximum to a, to a minimum. Is that what you're saying, Jean? Yes. yes. And, and, and applying, yeah. applying the other requirements of parking. So, you know, in site plan review, they could ask for a reduction based on a transportation demand management plan. Which is currently allowable for multifamily right. in addition to business districts. Right. But now you're going back to uh, almost like a special permit then, right? Because no. it wasn't the whole thing was to it, eliminate that extra stress so it would encourage someone to openly develop something, more, it, more housing as opposed to, I don't know now, it, I have to it's not. Still, it's still as of right development if they want, the same way they can get bonuses for afford, more affordability and for, you know, first floor commercial, they can get less parking if they put in a transportation demand management plan that is appropriate. So it, it, do, it, it remains as a right development. It just gives them choices about what they want to do. I, I'm not sure. I, I just see that we're pushing for uh, environmental and we're doing pushing solar, we're pushing trees. We want to um, help the environment, and then we turn around and say, no, we need more cars parking here. We want more traffic. Uh, I guess to see that both of these things are contradictory uh, to the two things, and I'd rather not, uh, I'd rather go all in uh, and say, hey, we do care about the environment, and we're going to minimize the amount of parking so there'll be less cars on the road. Um, people say there's too many traffic now on it, so by having more cars on the road, you get that, but if you're saying the, the maximum you get, I, I think, you know, I mean, I think this is, is that's what I'm thinking, if a developer or, or, how, or someone's buying a piece of property says, okay, if we have no parking, we're not going to be able to sell units. They're not going to build the units. They're just going to, they're only going to build it if it makes sense, physical sense. So if we have, if they need one, one space of parking per unit, then they'll build that one space. Uh, but if they don't, I think we, we should give them the ability to say, hey, you know, we're for the environment, the town's for the environment, let's not build it. And it's, it's near a uh, MBTA uh, bus stop or whatever, and we're doing all this green stuff, let's, let's do it. That's how I saw it, and that's how I, I believe how uh, the working group saw it, okay? And um, I'm just expressing that's what we, that's our, that was our opinion, okay? And, it is my opinion right now, too. Great. Steve? This is another, another one where I spent a lot of time going back and forth with myself. Um, as far as policy goes, we cater a lot to single occupancy vehicles. We encourage them a lot. And it's one of the most unsustainable practices we partake in as a society. <laughs> um, so I, I think the, my recollection of the, the sort of where the working group was is that we would prefer people not build any more parking than absolutely necessary. And that's, you know, where the minimum of, of zero and the maximum of one came, uh, came, came out from. With, in terms of going with a, a minimum of one and allowing for TDM reductions, I mean, that is consistent with the rest of the bylaw. It fits in. We kind of have a process for that. I think we might want to provide more residential specific TDM options. A number of them are, you know, very much geared toward mixed use. Um, yeah. But, you know, we should, you know, I, I'd like to see TDM that, you know, doesn't leave the applicant asking, well, what's the third thing that I can do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I could, 
I don't love the idea, but I could go along with it. Um, I could. Al I would also be happy with you know reducing the reducing the minimum to a half. Understood. So um, I agree with you, Steve. I I've gone back and forth on on this one a, a number of times um, in terms of the requirement. Uh, we one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind is that we have not identify that there's any requirement for the uh, parking to be specifically deeded or mm. leased with the, the property. So um, with the minimum as of, of one, I mean, what we've seen come in front of us is typically no more than one and, and often for a reduction. So I think naturally um, we're, we're seeing that occur. So by introducing um, a more um, progressive, to your point, Ken, um, policy with regard to supporting a lot of the climate-friendly um, climate policies that we have in town that accepting a, I, I could, probably go along with it with accepting, you know, the more I think about it, I could um, probably go along with accepting the parking, one spot parking maximum, knowing that, again, it's not deeded or associated with any one unit, and uh, there will be units that don't need parking and some that may need more than, than one, and that um, that is not unlike the situations that we are regularly reviewing today when it comes to the mixed use properties that come in front of us. So that's, I've, I've been <laughs> really thinking about this one and evolving, trying to evolve my, my thinking on this one, Steve. Well, well, one other option to just toss it out. If we were to kind of keep the existing, you know, one space per dwelling, minimum of one space per dwelling, just basically keep existing what we, what we have, and then just go back and revisit parking generally, um, I, I think that is also a, a, a decent path forward. At Springtown meeting? Yeah, at Springtown meeting. So I'll mention a couple of things. Um, MAPC did a report, Metro Boston Perfect Fit Parking Initiative, February 2017, and they did a survey in five communities, Arlington one, and in Arlington, they looked at six apartment buildings and parking lots. And what they found was there was an excess of spaces compared to the number of um, cars. And partially as a result of that, we recommended and town meeting reduced the parking number to where it is now, which is a minimum of one. And if you look at the chart, which I have from that report, it says the average Jim, parking it. it says the average parking demand per unit in Arlington is 1.04. So just over one space per car. And they also did some data searching is the average number of vehicles per household. Now this is 2017, so keep that in mind, but in owner occupied 1.7 vehicles per household, renters one vehicle per household. That's all consistent with um, keeping it at one. I'll just add a couple of other things. They did a recent report in a lot of the Metro West communities, not Arlington, and they came up with one space per unit seems to be the appropriate number. Now that included a lot of places that allow on-street overnight parking, which we do not. So I think compounding the need to have at least one space, I'd say one is the appropriate number per unit, is there is no overnight parking. And I, I will just add that, you know, there's now a pilot going on piloting it. Why is the pilot going on? Because people want to have overnight parking because they don't have enough parking. And we got at least one very compelling letter, email from a couple, 
and they both need to drive to work and they live in an apartment and they drive in the opposite direction and they're having a hard time with two cars. And I think if, if we want to make sure that the units that get built are available to everyone, that also includes people who need cars. Whether they're older mm -hmm. people who need cars, people with disabilities who need cars, or people who work places where they just can't hop on the bus or hop on a bike and get to work um, very often. I think we've been working with the one space per unit. We've, I agree with Steve completely. We should write in some more um, transportation demand management plan ideas for residential property. We have you know, talked about and allowed separating the units from the rentals so people would have mm -hmm. to pay more, those sort of things. So I would keep it at one, not, you know. Minimum of one is what a, you're saying. A maximum of one. Uh, a minimum of one, I'm sorry. A minimum of one and um, allow us through site plan review to reduce that if they want to have it reduced. They don't have mm -hmm. to have it reduced. And then we'll put in some transportation demand management pieces for that. Are you, oh, sorry. sorry, just a question for, for Jean. Are you suggesting that we, uh, so we will need, that would need to be another item that is added to this section or uh, a proposed change to the bylaw if we do want to add in more transportation demand options or per, you know, we'd have to work through those this evening one op option one right. or option two uh, we would need to um, we could decide to look at parking as a as a whole in either spring town mm -hmm. meeting or depending on the time and availability for the studies that are needed um, look at that either in, in fall or in in spring of 2025 I'd, I'd suggest saving it and amending the parking, parking in general or, or at least amending the transportation demand management in general in the spring rather than trying to figure out how to do that tonight I agree or in the next day or two mm -hmm. I'm gonna strongly disagree with that just because parking is the number one issue when it comes to developing multifamily housing it takes up the most amount of square footage on the on, on, the, um, on the ground floor it affects retail affects um, just the housing in general so by putting another burden on developing housing, you're, you're, you're essentially saying you're not encouraging housing by putting this thing on here, okay? Um, I, I feel strongly that if one is a requirement, then they're gonna build one. If, if, the, if, they're not, if, it's, if it's not required, then they, they're not gonna build it. And, that, and so we're following the, the uh, what we're trying to do is encourage housing. We're not trying to, stagment it and control it. We're trying to encourage it. And I don't want uh, to add all this extra rules and regulations or we'll look at this later. Uh, we're here to, to increase uh, the ability to put more housing on because that's what is in crisis now. Now, if we, if we say, okay, let's, you know, I think we're just delaying it, kicking a can down the road. So I'd rather not delay it. I'd rather put it on there. Um, I'm willing to compromise a little bit and say, let's say, uh, uh, half, which Steve said earlier, and I mean this is all about compromise. I, I will, I will go that way. A, a minimum of half, and see where that goes. Because they're, they're going to they're gonna build what they need to sell the units. They're not going to say just because we said half, they're just going to say, okay, well, we'll just build that way. That's my counter. Steve. Well, as, as uh, I agree that we shouldn't try to amend TDM tonight. <laughs> um, I, like, I, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to go either with, um, I'm, I'm okay with going with a minimum of one um, or one half. I think the advantage of one is if some of these 
builders want to come in and do less, we get a transportation demand manager. Mm -hmm. that's, that is true. And I think that's a really valuable thing to get from them and to have them implement. And we lose that if we go with a lesser number or zero. Can I offer another suggestion? Thanks. Kim, perhaps um, if we remain with the um, minimum of one, can we pair that with item four, rather than saying developments under this section may provide, developments under this section are encouraged to explore providing fewer parking spaces under the provisions of section 6.1.5, so that's F4. Yeah, and go after the... Um... So we really, we, we, we push them, you know, through the wording of, we, we maintain the existing requirement of minimum of one space, but pair it with developments are encouraged to explore providing fewer parking spaces under the provisions of 6.1.5. And if Jean or Steve, you have a better wording. I'm trying to, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, and I'm trying to um, ensure that there is a way that we but 6.1.5 is transportation management plan, right? I think, we, I think we'd say encourage to yeah, But that's geared for mixed use. It's not geared for all residential. Right, it's not, I'm it's just not gonna enough. Pull, let me pull yeah. that up okay. now. 6.1.5 includes um, shared parking, which is peak demand off-site parking, transportation demand, at least three of these, charge for parking. So charging for parking on site is, is one, stipend for workers, preferential. Perhaps we add, I'm going to propose, a section D, which is to, um, Uh, ensure that the spaces, we've often asked them to ensure that the uh, parking is not associated with specific units, again, whether that's deeded or mm -hmm. um, associated with the lease. We could put in, we could amend this section to include D or add that here to the overlay uh, mm -hmm. to allow for them to meet the transportation demand, um, you know, as, as one of the, the options, to give them another option here that has to do I with think separating giving, I, it I from think giving more options is, is good. It's just that most of the options there are men for mixed use. I mean, shared is one that's shared between commercial and residential. Understood. Um, you know, charging, yeah, okay, so you charge more money and you, uh, that you know, but that's still less decrease the number. Right. Um. I I think I think that um, the wording developments under this section are encouraged to provide fewer parking spaces than required by section six point one makes sense. I think if we start saying, you know, putting other requirements on it here, it sort of raises the issue about whether we're going beyond mm -hmm. what's in the underlying bylaw and raises some problem. So I like the idea of encourage and revisiting the entire parking thing, including um, beefing up the transportation demand management in the spring. Right, because we do have nine, such, uh, option C9, under 6.1.5, which is other means acceptable um, to the acceptable or to the applicable permit granting authority. Um, well, you guys have the vote right now, so I'm just going to let's move on. I don't think we're going to uh, get to a mutual agreement here just because um, I do feel strongly that, you know, we're, we're trying to put and capture and put regulations on something that we're saying we're not doing regulations for. And I just, I think this is just one extra burden that as, as, as I come in, 
say, oh, well, these guys want to encourage housing, but now they got all these other rules. That we just change one rule to another set of rules. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, here's what you can do and have at it. it, 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 it I don't know. I'm sorry. That's just how I feel, okay? And no, I appreciate it. I, I, I respect your feelings too, okay? I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. Um, so that I am clear between Steve and, and Jean what we would look to amend this um, to look like, which would be applying the current off-street parking requirements of 6.1, including and combining under F, one and four. So yeah, we'd have we'd have to fix F. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, so that we edit that to include that uh, developments under this section are encouraged to provide fewer parking spaces under the provisions. Yep. Of section six point one point five. And Madam Chair, uh, because yes. I don't think we've mentioned it specifically, um, the last sentence of F1 uh, states for no business, for business uses, no off street parking is required for the non residential space. Um, I would like to keep that. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Say that. I'm sorry I didn't hear that. So um, I, I am advocating that we retain the last section, the last sentence in F1. Um, that eliminates a off street parking requirement for non residential spaces. Which typically applies when the business is uh, under 3,000 square feet. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm in agreement with, with are, keeping Are we that. limiting it to 3,000 or are we just no. doing no matter what the No size? matter what the business use is. I, I would agree, Steve, with that suggestion to keep mm -hmm. that in. Me too. Gene, are you okay with keeping that one in? Sure. Okay. All right, uh, that covers parking. The next is uh, the, I'm looking at parcel in and out of this. It's the orifice? Uh, yes, we can go to that one next, sorry. There was another one that I was gonna take uh, before sorry. that, but let, that's okay, no. let's do orifice and we'll come to the other one next. Um, so excluding Mass Ave, uh, the uh, parcels that touch Mass Ave from Orvis to Alewife Brook Parkway. You so and I Jean, talked about, why don't you do this, take this one? Uh, sure. So um, in this proposal, again, much like uh, Arlington Heights, we've spoken as a board about uh, reviewing the, uh, the, the East Arlington business district to create uh, some more continuity where currently there is discontinuity in the zoning. Um, and one of the things that we discussed was identifying what we thought, much like we did in the Heights, what we thought the boundaries of that space that we would look like, look at would be. Um, and from Orvis Street to uh, Alewife Brook uh, appeared to be the uh, majority of the, the business district in East Arlington, um, my feeling is that rezoning those parcels potentially twice in two years mm -hmm. is, a, is a burden to the, the folks who own those parcels. And I'd prefer to do so at once. Um, and uh, when we look at this uh, after the, you know, we've committed to doing that after we, we do the uh, Arlington Heights Business District overlay, um, that we that we incorporate that at that time. Um, I'm appreciative of um, moving again. The the, uh, the neighborhood parcels had been removed by the working group. I think in order to spread out mm -hmm. the yes. um, the uh, impact across multiple parts of town. So um, I appreciate the study that um, included. Uh, reintroducing those when the parcels along Mass Ave were eliminated uh, in this study. So um, that's really the impetus for this particular uh, request. And I'll go to Kim. I have no problems with this. Steve? So of the two options available, um, my preference would be scenario 3B. Let me pull those up. Yeah, scenario 3A, um, while it is a, I think it is a fine proposal, I don't know if, I'm not sure, 
I would at least like to want to talk about having a provision to allow for deeper business districts. And here it's it, option A basically just removes everything fronting, um, yes. which means that we're we in in a, in, some, in a number of places we're left with narrow parcels with no ability to aggregate behind. Mm -hmm. um, so where as um, B gives us, I, I think, more flexibility to approach this in the future. So 3B would be my, my preference. Gene? Um, my preference is 3A3, which retains the parcels just off Mass Ave in the east. I, I hear what you're saying, Steve, but I think um, this is the area that's closest you know, it's on the 77 bus line, and mm -hmm. if they ever put in the so-called better bus project, there'll be another bus going down that part of Mass Ave to Elwife Brook Parkway. And so I think keeping those in is consistent with walkable neighborhoods. And um, I just think it's a better way to do it. I think it spreads out. Um, the district more appropriately, more appropriately across town. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, my thought was that looking at the business districts at a later point in time wouldn't also preclude, um, you know, changing the shape of the MBTA communities district at a later point in time as well. So I, I think it's I think it's still possible to to do. I think you could do both without, you know, necessarily having to commit to to one specific shape of the NMF in that area right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's possible that we can, you know, suggest superimposing an overlay on Mass Ave after we're done with the um, rezoning, or we may not need to, depending how we do the rezoning. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess I just think it's a mistake to remove all the parcels east of Orvis. From the, zone. the neighborhood parcels. The neighborhood parcels, yeah. Jim? Do you have um, a preference between um, 3A and 3B, the neighborhood parcels being removed versus retained? My first initial uh, look at that was I was supporting 3B, removing all of it, just because if you can make tweaks and changes, this, look at it holistically. If we, if we just leave chunks here and there, you can essentially handcuff yourself in making uh, whatever you want in the, uh, along Mass Ave. And uh, we agreed that we're going to look at that and, and just look at it and as a whole. But if we look at it now with this kind of zigzag -y thing there, it's, you're handcuffing ourselves in the future to make whatever you want to make changes to. Uh, we still meet the uh, criteria uh, by eliminating all of that. So I don't think uh, the intent is still there. We're still trying to provide, uh, uh, encourage housing. It's just that we're just doing it in a smart way as opposed to saying, let's have it here just because we want to. I'd rather look at it in a holistic way and say, uh, that's the way we should look at it. Sorry for ran on. No, thank you. Um, I will point out that there is a similar condition uh, in the Heights where we have bordering the boundaries of the business district, the, um, a neighborhood district. Um, I think that that is slightly different because of the grade change in that area, mm -hmm. but I do want to recognize that there is a similar condition um, in, in that section of Arlington along Mass Ave um, that, that we would be treating differently. Mm -hmm. I'd like to address that later when it comes up, yes. Yes, and I, I think that would probably be a good, you know, the next one that we should, because I don't think we had that one when Gene ran through his list, so I'll, I'll address that mm -hmm. one next. But, um, and it's not just Paul Revere, it's actually um, the areas uh, to the east of uh, Park Ave, directly behind the, the business district. We're, there is a similar condition to what we're looking at here. In, mm -hmm. um, in uh, the east. The uh, Gene, uh, Gene, uh, continuing the discussion around 
the parcels, the neighborhood district parcels. Um, any response to what, what uh, Kin and, and Steve just suggested in terms of their reasoning for wanting to remove all of the neighborhood parcels at this time in, in the east? I would have to think about that because I did not envision we are going to start zoning businesses off Mass Ave into the residential neighborhoods. And I, I, I didn't envision that we would think about when we talked about rezoning the east part of Mass Ave, that we would think about extending the business districts into the residential neighborhoods. I feel like if we can get some more height on the buildings in along Mass Ave and Broadway and more business things, we really don't need to go into the residential districts to add more businesses than we do now. And, and you know, if, if you're going to do anywhere, you'd probably do it on Lake Street, and Lake Street already has businesses extending down a little bit mm -hmm. off Mass Ave. Um, yeah. So, you know, if, if we want to encourage more housing development, I'd prefer to keep the residential units in in the overlay in East Arlington. Mm -hmm. So the, for me, the concern was mostly about the narrowness of a number of the parcels fronting Mass Ave in East Arlington. Yeah, they are. Now you can, you can of course get a, do, you have the, at least the potential for a, you know, a higher value commercial building if you can go a little deeper. <laughs> so could I suggest that that is only um, evident in a couple of parcels, um, knowing that we need to agree on moving a plan forward tonight, uh, would we be able to identify those which we might want to remove and deepen the parcels in other areas uh, this evening? I think that for this small, please. I uh, like your suggestion. Let's look at the heights and look at both of these uh, in, in tandem. So let's table no. this. Yes. This yeah, that's fine. Let's do and that. And we'll talk about East Arlington here along Mass Ave and also the heights along Mass Ave, and then we can look at it in both ways. Let's do that. At the same time. Okay, great. So let's now look at the two options uh, that were presented for the heights. And Ken, um, did you want to speak to these? I know that you had um, been discussing this uh, as part of the working group. Uh, I think that I think we were talking about um, oops, uh, scenario one and two at two A, right? Uh, I think uh, introducing three, three or four stories on along that area there where there's quite a, quite a bit of elevation there where I would say the ground floor is almost a story and a half higher in some areas to almost a story that it just makes it an unequal uh, way of laying out the project and I think that just um, makes it uh, a non-starter. I mean, if you want to uh, have some sort of business down there, you, uh, you're going to have to ch chip away at the at granite. If not, you're going to have to then just put residential there, and that's extremely difficult to do residential right on top of uh, um, a big rock, essentially, that's along that side there. So I was saying, I was thinking that we should find all the areas that would be more uh, more um, it would be easier to put this um, housing in. And uh, I think the group found something on the other side of Mass Ave. And I think that was good. So, so that's, 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 that was just it. Just the, uh, the locations for that just doesn't make sense. That's all. Great. Ken, can I ask you one question before we go to the others um, sure. for comment? Does uh, the, so the majority of these uh, in option, in alternative one, 
the majority of these sites in the Heights Extension area are in the neighborhood multifamily district. Does the reduction down to a maximum of three stories change your concerns at all in that area? No. Okay. Just wanted it's to ask just, the question. It just makes it very impossible to drive way up there. Um, just, that's fine. Yeah, so. Understood. Uh, Steve. In terms of the two maps, um, I don't have particularly strong feelings. I could go either way. Uh, Gene? Yeah, I, I looked at both areas. I, I, I don't have strong feelings except that if you go down Paul Revere Road, there are houses there now, so I don't see how they couldn't be converted to mm -hmm. three-story buildings. Yeah. Or that's my only question about that. So um, I, I too walked the topography of, of both of these areas and my concern, like Ken's, is that um, it's, it's challenging for many of these that are um, single family at this point to deal with the, the grade because of the, again, the, the driveways, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, once you start adding multifamily in this particular area without the, I believe that some of them have on-street parking waivers currently, but without mm -hmm. that as a um, official town policy, this becomes a, a challenging area, to Ken's point, to actually create um, multifamily housing housing within. So at, at this time, to, to me, it looks like the topography uh, is extremely challenging in this area to achieve the, the goal of the MBTA communities. Yeah, and I, I think alternative two has the, um, you know, one, one nice part about it is it does get close to the bikeway. And, you know, that is, that is one of, that is a transportation resource in, in, in Arlington. So do we, are we seeing a consensus towards, uh, Ken, you are in favor of alternative two? Yes. Steve? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm settling on alternative two. I'd prefer alternative two. Gene? I, I'd, I'd be fine with either, so two is fine. I okay. just wonder whether, if it's up, is it actually up against the bikeway? If it is, do we need to have some special rules for the buildings that are up against the bikeway? Can you give me an example? I don't know. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, I'm, yes. Sorry, go ahead. I, I'm saying what, what's, do we have special, I'm not sure we, we have we special don't. There's, rules. There's a special permit requirement. <laughs> yes. There are not other than um, it is a special, currently a special permit requirement mm -hmm. that would um, eliminate that for these parcels mm -hmm. uh, if they are included as part of the MBTA communities overlay district. I, I'm fine with that. I am as well. Same here. Okay. Okay. All right. So alternative two will be the recommendation. Uh, back to Orvis. Back to Orvis. <laughs> so again, I think just looking at what we looked at there in the, in the Heights, one of the things I actually liked is that there are a couple of districts that are deeper. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I really do feel that it's appropriate for that um, in this particular section in East Arlington. Um, I was actually surprised when I received the map that they are as shallow as, as they are in the neighborhood districts that were added in um, to the east of, of Orvis. So uh, interested in what people think about looking at deepening those, those parcels, particularly where there is a shallow parcel that is adjacent to Mass Ave. I think the north side of Mass Ave, after uh, Orvis, is, has some deep sites. Uh, I think the south side is, is uh, deep site challenged. If we were to look at that and uh, I, I don't want to use that uh, 
I agree with Steve that, you know, uh, that is a consideration, but I'd rather look at it and go back to the uh, original comments. And let's look at, let's take a let's look at this as a whole and instead of just looking at it and getting a piecemeal in for now. I think we made a commitment that we we're going to look at East Arlington along Mass Ave. Yes. We're, we're going to make a look at uh, Mass Ave along the Heights. Yes. And let's do that uh, in the spring where we can see the whole thing. And, and that's fine because I don't think including that in uh, and jamming it in with uh, 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 the Mass Ave here is just one extra thing that, you know, it could be, you know, like a consequence that came out of something that we didn't know about. Let's, let's just uh, take a little time to look at that area there. That's all. Okay. Gene? Is it possible to just eliminate the parcels behind the shallow parcels on Mass, on Mass Ave and keep the others in? Because yeah. if, if you look, let's say, between um, Orvis and Lake, there's just one shallow parcel, and then they're not too shallow until you get to between Edgerton and Melrose, and then there are a couple parcels along Milton, and then the rest of the way down. So maybe the way to do it is to be a little more discerning about which ones stay in and which ones leave. I don't know if we can do that and still have a contiguous district. That, I, I think that's the, ch the challenge with moving them around is, is maintaining contiguity. Unless, so my understanding, and Claire, perhaps you can answer this for us, is, um, the is the rough rule of thumb that was used that you went 150 feet in East Arlington and 350 feet in in the Heights? Correct. Okay. So could I suggest that we go to, back to 250 feet deep mm -hmm. in East Arlington, east of Orvis Road? to maintain the continuity. Uh, so basically giving us a wide, take, essentially taking what's, uh, what's proposed, what's scenario 3A and just moving it um, basically north of Mass Ave and south of Mass Ave. Yes. I, I think that's fine. I'm uncomfortable uh, making a decision like tonight on this. Um, when we looked at this originally, we did spend some time looking at this and I don't want to just decide that big of a swath change um, tonight here like this. Uh, I'd rather take some time to look at this and study it a little bit more. That's my opinion. Okay. Jean? Did we give notice to the owners 250 feet deep on both sides of this app? Um, we gave notice there's a 300 foot um, buffer required for notification, so those folks would have been noticed as part of the buffer accommodation. So if, if we do what Rachel suggested and extend the zone 250 feet on each side of Massive in East Darlington and remove some of the parcels that are on shallow, would we have given enough notice? So those property owners were notified of the uh, November, excuse me, the September 11th meeting. Um, I think I would have to go back and spot check to make sure, but I do think the board can be relatively comfortable with, yes, they've been noticed. Well, I think considering that they were once on the map and then they were taken off when the, the zone was moved, with the wider zone was moved west, I'm comfortable putting them back on because my understanding was they were removed not because they were inappropriate, but just to move things around a bit. So balance, balance the two sides. Yeah, so I'm I'm comfortable with what Rachel suggested and then removing the parcels that are are behind the shallow lots. So we, that's what that is. That's what I'm suggesting. So we would need to be specific as to which of these parcels we would want to remove uh, if, we, if we did want to remove any at this time, or rather uh, simply by extending this, 
allows us to ensure that um, if any changes are made in the future, that we still have a contiguous um, neighborhood zone. I, my preference would be to, sh to, to be basically redraw, take, redraw it along the 250 foot line and maintain our contiguity at that distance at from the, the street. Line. Yeah. Yep. And Steve, are you saying then to keep the current parcels with the extension or to remove some of the parcels? No, to, to move them. So if, if the, if like, um, just Between picking, Winter and Cleveland, for example? Yeah. Or for, I was thinking more along the lines of if you took the area felt between, say, Melrose and Fairmont, uh, those are probably, the, the southern edge of that line of parcels is probably 100 feet off the road, um, or 150 feet. I'm suggesting move that back to 250 feet. So it wouldn't be... In fact, adding, yeah, basically move, take what's there and shift it away from the road. <laughs> On both sides of Mesa? On both sides. Wouldn't be my preference, but I could live with that. Well, it wouldn't be my preference, but I could live with it too. <laughs> hey, you suggested it. It's not my preference, and I, I don't want to live with it. <laughs> I, I really do think that the, it should be deeper in, in this area. Mm -hmm. um, I don't disagree with you there, but I used to, don't want to rush because we want to get this out tonight. Mm -hmm. it's not, I'm not suggesting, I, I not, don't feel uh, like it's rushed yeah. because I feel like I've seen enough, okay. iter sorry, I want to make sure I'm speaking. I feel like I've seen enough iterations of this mm -hmm. and this was a concern that Jean and I raised several times was that um, this area was not deep, deep enough, you know, mm -hmm. relative to the way that we're exploring this in other areas. So um, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable extending this to 250 feet um, east of Orvis off of the center line of, of Mass Ave. Yeah, and again, my, I'm, I'm, the expectation is that we would look at the business districts yes. and, you know, perhaps doing infill with multifamily districts at the same time, you know, taking it you know, as one, do, as, as one whole. Okay. So what it sounds like we're centering around is um, accepting option scenario 3A with the caveat of extending the neighborhood districts to 250 feet, uh, the neighborhood district zone to 250 feet from the center line of Mass Ave from East of, uh, east of Orvis to the AOI Book, uh, Brook Parkway. Or at least to the streets here, which are Fairmont You're correct. And Thank Henderson. you very much. Is that to Fair, I need Fairmont to pull that up. Henderson. Fairmont, thank and, you. And I still need some clarity. Are we keeping the current parcels in that zone, or are we removing them all or some of them? I believe we are likely removing them and adding different ones in their place. All right, so all of these are going to disappear and be replaced. I'm not in alignment with that. Okay, that's what I'm trying right. to understand. Sorry, let me just take notes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you two want to keep discussing or... No, no. Okay, just, um, okay. so we're accepting alternate 3A, okay. Um, Can I ask, please. interrupt one? Okay, so there's, there'll probably be two things so far that I'm not in agreement with. Mm -hmm. So are we going to vote on these individually or vote on the whole thing as one to pass or not pass? And uh, That's a great question. Because I don't want this to fail because of the two things that I have feelings right. for. So but, I've been taking in more or less informal votes by asking for, for people's opinions. I am more than happy to take a uh, formal vote once we go through all of these on each one of these items, or if there are specific ones that we want to, for record, ensure that we have individual votes for, and then pass the uh, overall, um, we, we, need to, we need to take a singular vote on this Warren article at the end of the day. So uh, we can, continue, if the board feels comfortable, we can continue in the way that we have been working through this. And again, this is a public working session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, uh, where we informally identify 
what we are uh, what we are planning on on accepting as the amended version of this to move forward into town meeting, or we can take we can identify which we would like to take a um, formal vote for record on, knowing that at the end of the day we need to vote on a singular mm -hmm. Warren article to uh, provide favorable action or um, to, to uh, vote action or no action on. Okay. So would you prefer to take a formal vote on several of these for record leading up to the vote of action or no, no action? we do it also okay. at the end. Okay. So going back <laughs> to uh, the, the, the depth of, of this uh, district, um, so we, this would be extending from Orvis Road to uh, Fairmont on the south side of Mass Ave and Henderson Street on the northern side of Mass Ave to 250 feet from the center line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Residential this. only properties. Right. Residential zone properties. Okay. Um, and I apologize. I don't have the map pulled up while I'm typing. It's Henderson. And Fairmont. Fairmont. Henderson Street and Fairmont Street. Thank you. Uh, yes, and the, and the reason it stops there is because of flood plain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, the next item is. Wait, wait. I, I need clarity on are we removing the current parcels or are we just adding more depth to the current parcels? My, my preference is to just add more depth. Well, that's my preference too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mine is not. Wait, well, Correct. actually, no, adding more depth, that means, so I, I, if, if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, that means we're not really addressing the shallow parcel phenomenon. Again, if there are specific parcels that you would like us, we, we need to then be specific about mm -hmm. which, which parcels. Yeah. Well, I think overall the district is too too narrow in this area. Again, my my request was mm -hmm. to. Well, if um, I would, my prefer. All right, I'll throw it, throw an alternative out. Please. So um, so widen to two hundred fifty feet on either side of Mass Ave. Yes. And remove everything between everything less than one hundred fifty feet from Mass Ave. So think of drawing a thick band and then hollowing out the middle. Where'd 150 feet come from, Steve? That is my opening offer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of a parcel that we would consider deep enough and what, how so deep I, it is. Well, I would like to leave 100 feet on either side of Mass Ave. 150, 150. 150 uh, at least 100 feet of parcel depth for future business district expansion. All right, that makes more sense to me than 150 feet. Okay, um, then let's. Then I will. I will. I will change my offer to 100. <laughs> 100, 100 feet from I the think, center line. I think line. it's too arbitrary. I think really? we should leave it as as it is now. And um, I personally, I, I I think we need to um, extend extend the name. I, I, I would not be comfortable setting an arbitrary number. I know that 250 feet is what we originally mm -hmm. started with looking at for the depth of this district. For some reason that I don't understand, it was narrowed. Um, I think it's too shallow now to provide any real continuity, and I'd, I'd prefer to see what we have now for the neighborhood districts deep into 250. Okay, I'll agree with that.
My preference would still be to go with three with the other option and clear everything off of Orvis Road and come back to it. But if Madam Chair, if you and Mr. Benson agree, I'll 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 go along with it. Ken? Nope. Fair enough. So you're uh, now just a clarification. 250 feet. Some of the parcels may be part in and part out. Are they therefore in or out of the district? What have we done up to this what, point? What was the working group? Um, sorry to press my point again, but that's where we took time and looked at things. I understand, but this was requested to be looked at and it was missed. And so I, I don't feel comfortable moving forward mm -hmm. with, with this until we address it. So perhaps we identify that we um, go one parcel deeper on each of the, uh, on each of the, um, both north and south of um, That Mass would be Ave. fine. It's just, it's too shallow. Mm -hmm. can, can somebody explain? I, I think that may be fine, but it would be helpful if somebody who is on the working group, Steve or Ken, can explain what led to the shrinking of the depth and how this was determined to be the, the proposal? Uh, so the, this was in basically the, feel, the feeling of the working group at the time was that it was too heavy in East Arlington because there were um, districts along two corridors, Mass Ave and Broadway. And with the heights, because of the way the business districts come out, there are a lot of areas where, you know, you don't have anything on the, the business, you have business par commercial parcels on the north side, and you bas we basically had a, a skinnier strip on the south. Um, so, so, so now that we, if we remove the Mass Ave parcels, that changes the scale, and we would therefore need to add back is that that's fair. a fair way to look at mm -hmm. it? That's how I'm looking at it, Gene. Okay. Yes. I'm fine with that. So one more parcel deep. So I would propose to um, extend the neighborhood district by one additional parcel. Let's be very clear on this. Between... Um, between Lake Street and oh. Fairmont, right? Lake Street, Fairmont, and Henderson. On the south side. Right. And? Windsor and Henderson on the north side. Which one are you suggesting? Win Windsor and Winter? Henderson. Winter, I'm sorry, and Henderson on the north side. Winter and Henderson on the north right. side. Right. May I suggest a few specific Please. parcels for removal? Please. Okay. So, so um, let me let me uh, just update that. So north side. Jean, can you just read off the streets for me again? It please? was for, on north side from Winter to Henderson, and on the south side from Lake to Fairmont. What about those two blocks between Orville and uh, Winter? That, what happens there? They have deep parcels. No, yes, I, I, yes, Gene, they have deep parcels. Right, that's But right. what are we doing there? Are we just saying leave it alone, or are we leaving it as a neighborhood community and leaving the, the front side right. open, because that's business? I just want to know what we're doing there. As, as proposed in the current map. OK. And that would be the same between Orville and Lake Street? That would be as yes. proposed? Yes. So a current map as, as in 3A? Yes. yes. Okay, so, uh, so start, I'm going to work from 
east, sorry, from west to east, left to right, um, starting on the north side of Mass Ave, um, remove, you know, widen the row between Winter Street and Cleveland, and also between Cleveland and Marathon. So you're adding additional parcels to the neighborhood community? I'm suggesting here? removing parcels from the neighborhood. Actually, may, may I go up to the map and point? That might be easier. Sure. Okay. I just wanted to get on stage. So I'm suggesting um, knock out this little narrow strip, so a row of parcels here, one row here, this tooth, this tooth, these teeth, this, 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 and that's it. Just one parcel deep. Yeah, basically. I don't feel like we have enough um, detail shown on this map to see the parcel size to be able to make that call of removing them. Gene, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I prefer to, to keep them in, again, without, okay. without the information. Unless, unless somebody from the working group has the underlying lot configuration here. Yeah, look at scenario 3B. Perfect, thank you. That shows the parcels. So I don't have both printed out in mm. front of me. Here. It's 3B, what's, what's the other one you want? 3B and 3A side by side if we could. I got chicken scratches all over it though. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Steve. So you were suggesting, so you were suggesting which parcels? Uh, so start with winter. We'll start mm -hmm. with the, between winter and Cleveland. Yes. Um, so there's kind of behind the commercial section there, there's that big L-shaped one. I think we're going to we leave that one in. Leave that one. Yep. Um, but we can go back one more along Cleveland Street. We could also go back one more between Cleveland and Marathon. And at the corner of uh, Windsor and Mass Ave, one more deep there. Between Win Windsor? Or yeah, so the corner of- Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yep. yep. And so let me take a look at Amsden. Yep, go, go one in on the, corner, on the uh, northeast corner of Amsden. Jumping back and forth between these. And then, uh, so let's go around Milton Street. So yep, there's- Those two small- Yep, those, yep. Two, those two little ones. Yep. Um, so let's go over between Varnum and Magnolia. I think that can stay, actually that one can, st I think that can stay as it, as is. Yep. And then uh, Thorndike, there's that, you know, you've got two little ones on the corner there. Uh, the southeast corner of Thorndike and Mass Ave. Can I get them 
Perfect. Did you want us to look at the? No. no I was looking on. Okay, you're good. I think that's all fine. If anybody, I'm a, can uh, actually, that's acceptable to me. Yeah, if anybody can actually commit it to paper or something, so they know what. I I will you read that, that out. I will read that out when we make the motion. Okay. notes. Okay. Uh, so the next item on our agenda or on our list was confirm that we are aligned on zoning when looking at parcels in and out of the overlay district. Jean, this was one that you added. Um, this was section this. Uh, 5.9.1 C where we wanted uh, Jean wanted to confirm that the uh, board was aligned with the text that he added for if a proposed development is located on a parcel or parcels only partially within the Mass Avon Broadway multifamily district or the multifamily neighborhood um, districts the provisions for the existing underlying zoning shall apply and not that of the overlay districts. Because that was, that was missing from this, and I could no, see. I, I agree. And I could see a situation where that happened, mm -hmm. and, and things would creep down some of the side streets. I understand that, uh, Jean. But when you, uh, now you, now you, you change the, uh, uh, the area which you're, um, you're allowed to do as of right. Um, I, I would propose that uh, if a new parcel straddles two different parcels, one MBTA, uh, MBTA uh, overlay and one that it does not straddle that, then each parcel that's on each in its respective um, area would have to follow that area's uh, regulations. Because the way you're saying is now, uh, the area that was an MBTA area is now, uh, because you're combining lots, you're making it uh, uh, more restrictive because now you have to go through special permit, you get to do all this other stuff. So you, you're actually decreasing the number of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of lots or areas that, that do that. No, I think, I think you're misunderstanding what I'm doing. I, I'm not changing something so if a parcel is in the Mass Broadway multifamily district, it complies with those rules. But how about a parcel that's um, partially within that district? The parcel's all in that district. Then somebody buys and combines the properties. The adjacent property yep. and combines properties. So you had a parcel that was in the district, in the overlay, and you had a parcel that was not in the overlay. They've now combined them. The question is, which of the rules apply? I think the rule that should apply is the underlying rule, or else somebody could buy three or four parcels, combine them, and all of a sudden you'd have you know, a tall building way into the neighborhood, which was not the intention. I would agree with you there, but if I were to look at it the other way, if I had one parcel that was not in the overlay, one parcel that was in the overlay, now you're saying if I combine those two pieces of property because it makes a bigger lot, then that bigger lot has to, has to fall, not within MBD communities, has to fall within the original the uh, underlining, right. underlining. Right. That's, so, right. So that means you're carving in 
to that portion that was in MBTA now no longer becomes that because you combine the lots. Only if you combine the lots. You don't have to combine the lots. You could do it the other way. This was silent. It didn't say, and I decided we needed to know which way we were going to go. And one of the comments that I read from someone, I don't remember who it was, said, you know, these things are going to proliferate. That's not the word that the person used. Proliferate all the way down and, the street. And, and, I, and I, I agree with you. But what if we just said that the lot that was on MBTA stays with that, and that portion of that project can fall within the height requirements and everything else that goes with the MBTA, but the lot that was not cannot assume that uh, those rights. They have to stay with the underlying rot lots, uh, so, it, so it doesn't continue down the street. But, but what was existing before maintains the, uh, uh, the rights of the MBTA how, overlay. How would that work? So you, you own a parcel in the overlay. You buy the parcel next door, which is not in the overlay. Mm -hmm. You combine them. You want to put something on both parcels. So one is two and a half stories high, and the other one is four stories high or three stories one, high. One building, you have to get a special permit for half the building. And no, you, f you follow the, what's required for... Yeah, you could get a special permit if you want to make it all the way across the same way, and we have the chance to review it. But let's say on that parcel that was not in the overlay, and uh, the, as of right, is two and a half stories, and it's just a house. So, and then once you step onto the overlay, they can go to a three-story or four-story, wherever we decide, okay? And now, so now it could be a row of townhouses uh, in those two combined lots, because you got rid of the side yard setbacks and it makes it more efficient. The portion that was existing in MBTA would get the benefit of MBTA, and the portion that was not has to be following the underlay requirements unless they go for a special permit. And that's all I'm saying is maintaining the rights of the MBTA instead of just, if you combine lots, now you're encroaching on, on the other side. You're, you're doing the direct opposite of what you're saying trying to prevent, which is marching down the road. You're just marching down the road with uh, non-MBTA requirements if you can buy lots. Steve? I think I'm going to agree, agree with Mr. Lau. So how would you reword this? Because I... Um, I'm struggling to see how you would have your foot in both in both spaces. I, I, I actually agree with Jean in that I, I, we need to pick a lane here mm -hmm. and either decide that one governs or, or the other. I, I'm really struggling with how, how a site plan review versus a special permit process coexist and um, we are drawing a line down the middle of a building to identify that half of it meets one set of rules and the other half meets the other. Well, there's, well, in terms of, um, you know, applying a special permit or applying site plan review to a, par to a partial product project, uh, this is something the Zoning Board of Appeals does all the time. You have someone who's rebuilding something, but they want to do, go out a little, move, you know, go, go forward a little bit with a porch. So you have a special permit hearing, which is focused on just the porch and only the porch. Understood. Mm -hmm. we, um, much like we do for signs and other yep, yep, items. Yep, yep. Right. Exactly. Um, if the proposed development is open. Can I? Go ahead. Um, the portion of the building that is not in the MBT communities, if it still falls within its, its uh, underlying uh, zoning, you don't need a special permit. So, so, so you would build a... a De depending on the, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of if, then, Yeah, but, but it's the same with everything else we're, we're doing here. So if we had a project that's, that they wanted to combine properties, the portion of the, uh, of the, of the property that was on MBTA would have its all, all its rights, and the portion of the property that does not have it does not. So let's say... Um, 
so one half of it uh, has to maintain its underlying uh, zoning things. So it, it, it achieves what Gene's trying to say. You don't buy property to combine and carry that all the way down the street. It stops where we had it stopped. But, but it doesn't go the other way where just because you combine properties, now you, have, now you have to fall within the older scheme. So you can have uh, townhomes, uh, three, four story, uh, three, four family units. And then when you st when you step over the MBTA, it goes down to two, and that's maybe you have some. Uh, townhomes I, are a whole other. But that's what that's what. Well, you asked me how would you build one pro one one building that would fit that would straddle both properties, and I just gave you an example. That's all. Yes, yes it is another, but I'm just it's an example. Okay, Steve. Well, in terms of wording, I'll. Here's an idea. Uh, so 591C. Uh, so the last um, you know, sort of the ending of it, starting with the, the word yes. the. Okay. The provisions of the underlying uh, the provisions of the existing underlying zoning shall apply to parcels outside the overlay district. So if, if Ken and you, as a partnership, have combined these two parcels, they're now one parcel. They're not two parcels anymore. So you can't say uh, yeah. one parcel is in and one parcel okay, is fair, out. Okay, fair point. But the, uh, but the rules are saying that the, it would still, uh, when you combine the parcels, the, the original zoning for each parcel still carries forth uh, on the MBTA overlay. So, it, so that's all I'm saying. Because otherwise, it, it, in, you're decreasing what you already established as, as the, as the squ as square footage. If your point is to decrease it, then let's decrease it. Let's so, not so use this as a... I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone's looking to, to decrease it. It's, it's again, to... Um, Deal with the with um, over. And I agree with you. Let's not do over and let them right. march down the street. Right. That's not the issue here. Right. And I, again, I I I don't think Gene is at all looking mm -hmm. for ways to decrease. Right. So so there are a whole bunch of requirements that will exist in the underlying district that will not exist in the overlay district. Not only whether you need a special permit or not, the height, the number of units, the dimensional requirements for various sorts of things. I just think it's, it's going to be crazy to try to take whether they're two or three townhomes or, or a six-unit multi-building and figure out what to do with part of it in what had been a parcel in the overlay district and part of it that had been a parcel that was not in the overlay district. And two sets of rules, two different pop procedures to follow. It just makes it a lot worse mm -hmm. for the developer. The developer would be better off not combining the parcels, building one building on one and one building on the other or figuring out whether it wants to go with the underlying zoning and do it, rather than, oh, I've got to go for a special permit for this part of the building, and for site plan review for mm -hmm. this part, I have one set of dimensional rules for one part of the building, another set of dimensional <laughs> rules for the other part of the building. It just seems to me it, it's a way to make a lot of trouble. I, I would actually agree. I think, again, we're trying to simplify and make things easier to develop. And I, um, if you're interested in creating a project where you combine parcels creatively in that way, um, treating them as separate projects seems mm -hmm. to be the appropriate way to approach no, this. I, I appreciate, I point taken um, about uh, simplification. So it sounds like three of us are in agreement on this one. OK. 
Okay. Um, the next is around adding street tree requirements subject to uh, zoning bylaw uh, 6.3. The, yes. The other, there's another part which Ken will disagree with me again, I predict. I'm, okay. I missed that. So, I apologize. No, that's okay. It's the first part of that sentence. So right now the rules are if you're part in the MBMF and part in the NMF, the provision of the MBMF can apply. Okay, so let's take, um, let's take one of these parcels that is on Mass Ave, so it's in the MBMF, and then there are six parcels down the side street, or five, whatever the number turns out to be, that's in the NMF. You combine them all because you've bought up those parcels. You now have a large parcel, part in the MBMF, part in the um, neighborhood multifamily district. If you apply the rules of the MNFFs, you can build a six-story building that is not only on Mass Ave, but goes five or six parcels down one of the side streets and you can put commercial on the ground floor in, the in, in what otherwise would be a residential district. Was that the intention of the working group to allow that? Or was it just, well, if there just happens to be a parcel right around the corner, it makes sense to yeah. allow it? I believe we were considering the case where it was you know, something along you know, on Matt with frontage on Mass Ave and a parcel behind it. Yeah, but not. But, but you not, understand not how necessarily a whole string. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is a problem with how it's written. Unless you want to say one parcel deep off Mass Ave or Broadway is, a, is I think, a way to ameliorate the potential mm -hmm. problem. So perhaps we could, if I could make a suggestion, the provisions of the MBMF district shall apply um, for a maximum of one parcel depth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Into the NMF. Yep. That's good. Ken. Okay. In the spirit of um, compromise, yes. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Moving on, uh, adding the street tree requirements subject to ZBL 6.3. So if, if we're going to bring a street tree amendment to town meeting, the street tree amendment, if town meeting approves it, would say they're in residential districts too, then all we would have to do here is add something to the regulations that say um, the, the, all of these are subject to section 6.3. No, yeah, I, I believe that's the, that was the- That was the intent. Yeah, that was the intent. Ken? Um, the, M, the, the intent of the MBTA community uh, zoning overlay was to, was to uh, make it easier to build housing. So there, there were bonuses that were added to encourage affordable housing, uh, site changes, solar, whatever. So I think we, in, in the spirit of it, I think since we're already covering street trees as part of something that we, we wanna put as a zoning ordinance that would just go and, and, and stand on its own, but not tie this in with uh, the MBTA communities, because we're not giving it a bonus, we're making it a requirement. We are making it a requirement. It's part of the MBTA communities. And we were asked to do that. And is that part, is that legal uh, it, for it, a challenge, because now you're making a, something that's a requirement, and uh, the issue was not to make it a requirement. I'm not saying, I'm not for street trees, I'm just saying, does this stand the test? It, it stands the test if we amend, if town meeting amends, yeah the street tree bylaw to, right now the street tree bylaw only applies to 
certain commercial buildings. Our proposal is to have it apply to, to residential as well. To residential as well. So then if we make it a requirement here, it's, it's a parallel requirement. It's not a problem. Dan, can we make it, uh, make it uh, saying that if, if the town passes that, uh, this order, uh, ordinance, then this would become part of it. Otherwise, if, if the town does not pass it, this is not a requirement uh, as part of MBTA. I, again, I think this goes back to the question of are all of the items from the underlying zoning requirements unless otherwise amended or um, state or uh, addressed in, in this here? And I see Sanjay raising his hand. Like yes, there's a microphone right over, or the chair right over by Claire. So in terms so, of... Sanjay, sorry, oh, if you could yes. just introduce yourself for the record. Sanjay Thank Newton, you. I was chair of the uh, MBTA Communities Working Group. I, I think this question of the what applies from underlying zoning versus what... Um, I think what the working group was going for and, and the intention was that, you know, where there are spe things that are specific to the underlying zone, those don't apply to the overlay. Right? Where there are things that apply to zoning in general, those do apply unless specifically noted. So if, they're, you know, if the underlying zone is, I'm going to pick um, R4 or R5, right? things that are specific to R5 don't apply. Right? If there are things that apply to all residential zones, right, then those would apply. Or all zones. Or, or, sorry, all excuse zones. me, excuse me, all zones. Is, excuse me, is, all zones. Yes, so yes, 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 yes. No, so you, he's interpreting it the way I have interpreted it. Correct. Which is, this is not a business zone, this is not a residential zone. So the business zoning requirements, the residential zoning requirements don't apply. But the part of the zoning bylaw that applies to all zones yes. would apply to it. So you and I agree on that. So then we wouldn't need to add anything in, Gene, if town meeting passes... Uh, no, no, we... Well, article, go, can I just finish my thought? Okay, go Article ahead. 10, because the way that we currently have it written in Article 10 is that it should be administered, it is subject to be administered by Section 3.3, .3, Special Permit 3.4, Environmental Design Review, and Section 9.X, which is what this will be, um, which would then allow this to apply to both residential as no, well as... No, because not, unfortunately, not the way I wrote it. We'd have to amend it because what it says... We could amend it when we get to in, that one, yep. In, right, in the business and residential districts. Can we right. change it to all districts? When we get to, when we get to Article it's, 10, it's, I will have some wording proposed, some wording it's, changes to propose. It's, it's <laughs> because so the article it, is written as all uh, developments, not specific to the, the Article 10, the way it's written is require a street to be, tree to be planted for every 25 street feet of street frontage for all developments. All new so we have yeah. some well, latitude the, the to yeah. the edit that. The problem with that is that we have, we have a different street tree requirement in the industrial zone already. And it's specific but that is an to exception to zone. this. So we would have to but it's already an exception in the industrial. No, but if we say in all districts, then we have a contradiction in the bylaw. Then so we perhaps we write all districts except the yes, industrial we district. Yes, would have to do that. Okay, and that would allow us to not have to add it to this one, and we will take care of editing that when we get to Article 10. With that... I have to think about which one's better. Okay. Yeah. Other thoughts? Nope. I'm happy Can? with that. Okay. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, okay, so we will um, review altering the wording Article 10 um, to include the overlay district. Yeah, I guess we could say, just, just to think Please, let's finish through, the thought out, yep. Just to think this through for a second, we could say in the business, residential, 
and MBTA overlay districts. We could be as specific we as we want as, to get. Right. Yes. So we could do that. Yes. Multifamily housing overlay districts. Okay. Yes. So not in this uh, article. We'll do that in Article 10. Okay. Yep. Uh, the next item is uh, solar roof requirements for the uh, Massachusetts and Broadway multifamily district. Gene, your thoughts on where to add this? Yes, so let me pull up the um, solar bylaw for a second. So right Section now- Section 6.4. Right, right now the solar energy system only requires, uh, um, is for project requiring um, environmental design review. Correct. Um, my th and those projects, as, as we know, are generally projects along Mass Ave and Broadway that require a special permit. My thought is that we should apply it only in the, M in the Mass and Broadway multifamily district, not in the neighborhood district, because there we're dealing with a lot of three family homes and we're not, we haven't imposed that requirement there. So I would just impose it on the two streets where we, where we have it now for EDR review. You know, the, the alternative, well, we can't do that because it's too late. So we can amend the solar bylaw. So Gene, are you suggesting that we add, uh, for example, a section, um, 13 or fold it into the development standards? Either that or put a separate section. Yeah, one or the other. We might put it in the development standards. I feel like it belongs in the development standards. Uh, sure. Steve, what are your thoughts? No, that, that's fine. Ken? Development standards in the MBTA overlay or a separate ordinance? Uh, much like in section 5.9.4 development standards, we reference other sections that apply and do not apply to identify that section 6.4, the solar energy systems requirements um, are required in the Mass Ave and Broadway multifamily district. That would be a line item under the development yep. standards. Yep. So, it'll be, so it'll be no longer 6.4. Uh, 6.4 stays in, you know, that is in the zoning bylaw. We're referencing here that, um, for example, 6. unfortunately, because of the way 6.4 is written, it requires, uh, so we could do it one of two ways. We could either say a project requiring environmental design review per 3.4.2 or... Um, Except we can't do that because we don't have a solar bylaw article going to town. So we have to put it in the we, Right, so that, that is one way to do. So, right, there's two ways. We could either do that, but you're right, we don't have that, that one currently in, or uh, again, we add uh, no, it, before number 12 or- Somewhere in there. Somewhere in here, we add um, the, uh, or section 6.4.1 applies to uh, all projects in the uh, MBMF. I don't know. I just, I just seems like we're getting away from the spirit of this overlay, and we're burdening it with all these other criterias. When clearly it says that uh, we're giving it um, relief from all these other extra burdens, and if you want to do other things you get a bonus for it. But I don't see a bonus for this. This seems like you have to do this or you don't get it. That's right. exactly right. Because the town has identified that for these large uh, so, developments that a, uh, this solar bylaw is, is important to the town. So leave it as the town zoning is the underlaying and that still applies and just take it off an MBTA requirement. It, 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 doesn't. it doesn't because it, the way that that is written is it requires environmental design review. So we need to, like these other things, make the provision that it also applies for this process, which is site plan review. So because they're not coming in front of environmental design review. So it's a requirement for site plan review only. 
it is it is a requirement for the uh, multifamily business, the, excuse me, the Massachusetts and Broadway multifamily districts within this process, um, which again is not specified in that particular section because it is specific to environmental design review. But again, because it's only the Mass Ave and Broadway, these are the larger projects, again, that are aligned with mm -hmm. the requirements. Oh, I'm all for yep. this requirement. I'm just not sure how we do this now. And I, and I, and, and, um, I mean, I, I, it would, ideally, we would handle this in the same way we handled trees. <laughs> yes. Except, except we don't have a solar bylaw going to town meeting. Mm -hmm. So we can handle it this way. Because this is how you've done it with affordable housing. You could have amended the affordable housing part of the zoning bylaw mm -hmm. to include this district, but you didn't. And there's nothing wrong with not having done it. Either way, I think, is perfectly acceptable. Instead, what, what the working group decided to do was to say the affordable housing requirements apply to to these. Similarly, we say the solar bylaw requirements apply in the, you know, MBMF district. So Claire, I have a question for you before we discuss this further. Much like we have amended multiple sections, um, section two definitions and section um, five district regulations, because of the way that the Warren article is written, relative to um, amending the zoning bylaw to adopt the MBTE community overlay district or take any action relative thereto. We're defining site plan review as part of the MBTA community's overlay district. Would it be reasonable to assume that the scope of this Warren article would also allow us to amend section 6.4 to include uh, site plan review in, exist in addition to environmental design review? Yes, it would be correct to assume that. I, I would want to get a ruling from the moderator, because if he says the other way, then we're sunk. And I don't think we need to do it. I think it's just as acceptable to put it into this new section 5.9. My, my concern about, uh, I, I understand where you're going, Madam Chair. My concern is that might put us into the two-thirds uh, um, territory. I mean, I, I'm fine with putting it into development standards. I'm just trying to find a way that's um, clean. <laughs> To, to do this. So I'm, I'm fine with adding another section saying that 6.4 is applicable in the um, MBMF district. Okay. okay. Signs. Signs. So, um, since Sanjay and I agree about what the intention was in this, and if you look at the sign bylaws, for each one of the signs, they say what the rules are for residential, residential slash business, business districts, but there's no rule for the overlay district. And we don't want to put this in the residential district because some of them may be multi-use, some of them might be tall apartment buildings on Mass Ave and Broadway. And if you look at those, the higher R district numbers have different sign rules than the lower R district numbers. So my thought about how to do this is similar to what I'm proposing for the solar bylaw, which is to say uh, it's subject to the sign bylaw and in the NMF, it subject to the requirements of the residential sign district. In the MBMF for residential buildings, it's subject to the residential slash business sign district. And for mixed use in the MBMF, it's subject to the business sign district because that most correctly corresponds to how we deal with those things now. 
that makes sense to me, Ken? I'll be fine with that for now, yeah. I'm also fine with it, Madam Chair. Okay, can you, so that I can um, put that in for record so that I can read it out, can you, is that written on? It's, it's this one right uh, here. Thank you. Uh, let's. The, I'll come back to the next one. Um, Jean, while I'm typing this out, um, Jean, if you want to go to the duplicate requirements. Okay. Um, so if you look at... Um, where's the duplicate? So if you look at 59410, it says the minimum front setback is 15 feet except in the MBMF district where the ground floor facade facing public way, blah, 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 is zero. But then if you look at the next page, it tells you it's 15 feet in the chart, and in the bonus right below that, it tells you that um, there's no... Um, front yard setback, it's reduced to zero. So you have the exact same information in the chart in 12 and in bonuses as you have in 10. So my suggestion would be to delete 10 from 5.9.4D10, except take the sentence that says minimum required front Setback areas shall be available for uses such as trees, landscaping, benches, tables, chairs, play areas, public art, or similar features, and move it to a note under the chart on the next page, which is really where it belongs, I think. The only thing is you can't say public art because it's not technically public art. It's art. It's mm -hmm. not the public art. So we would have to remove the word public, but we could otherwise take it and move it to an explanation of what we expect in the foot setback. So that, that's how I think we get rid of that duplicate. Oh, Gene, the, the intent was to have a 15-yard setback along Mass Ave and Broadway. Right. Not and, changing that. And then if you did a mixed-use... Uh, project along uh, Mass Ave and Broadway, the, the lower floors, or you, you delete that setback. I'm not changing that. I'm just saying it appears twice in here. I just want to get rid of one of the two times it says it. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So you are, I just want to make sure that I'm writing this properly. We're eliminating the first sentence and we're moving the second sentence to the chart in 12. Well, the second and, and the third sentence, the parking spaces are not permitted. We're moving both of those. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rachel? Yes. Can we go back to site certifiable? Yes, absolutely. I have those highlighted to go back to. While I was taking notes, I just couldn't do both of those at the yep. same time. Thank you. Um, I just, um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to. Let you finish. I wish we had a. Somebody to take notes for me here. Uh, okay. Second and third. Because I have to read this all back to us at the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna highlight that one. And that one. Okay, let's go back to the sites. Certifiable. So can I take this one, Jean? Please do. Okay. Um, my feeling is that for an additional floor, certifiable is not a high enough standard. Um, I've seen the lead certifiable checklists that come in front of us, and they are barely checking a box. They typically have no understanding of what it is they are actually filling out. Um, and for us to allow for additional floors, 
I, I feel like they actually need to be doing something <laughs> to make the projects more sustainable. I also question whether sites is the right standard. Um, I work in the green building space and I, I rarely, if ever, see any sites um, certifiable or site standard, you know, in terms of the, the rating system come in front of me. So my suggestion would be to um, reword this to perhaps use um, lead gold certified or equivalent level of alternative alternate alternate green building standard as reviewed and approved by the Department of Planning and Community Development or the Redevelopment Board. So give them an option to use passive house, well, sites if they want to, but set a standard that is um, more regularly seen um, and adopted within the green building community and set a certified rather than certifiable standard so to achieve the additional can you story. Say, so lead gold certified. Certified or equivalent level of alternative, alternative or alternate, um, excuse me, green building standard as reviewed and approved by the Department of Planning and Community Development and or the Redevelopment Board. So it would be through the um, town's environmental planner or through the review process for site plan review. My, my, I like that. My suggestion would be approved by the Redevelopment Board because then we could have either Claire or David Morgan or whoever go to us and explain why and it's, a, it's an appropriate one to use in this situation and then we could make the call. I'm, um, I'm okay with that but I, I agree I think that I would want to involve the experts yeah, in they, our they, in our town um, come to the meeting. planning yeah. department in that process. Yeah. Agreed. Ken what are your thoughts on that one? Uh, thinking. The, Understood. The, the other thing that we could do is if there are two or three other standards, would we want to adopt them in our rules and regulations rather than if, if there, sorry, if there are other standards, or do we want to adopt them in our rules and regulations rather than a, a you know a case by case basis? That's a that's a great question. My my feeling is that um, there are. The standards continue to evolve, which I think is, is great. Yeah. Um, and I, um, our rules and regulations, to your point, are easier to, um, easier to revise adopt and, and adopt yeah. a minute. Thank you, adopt an amend. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I think this approach would be similar to what we just adopted with regard to the um, the uh, water, the stormwater treatment where we identified a standard or mm -hmm. alternative path as opposed to naming all of the okay. alternatives. So in my mind, it's consistent That's with fine. what town meeting approved yep. previously. Uh, I think I agree with you that certifiable is, uh, is not uh, correct to get a, uh, an extra floor bonus. And uh, The buildings won't get any taller. They, they're just going to have to choose. Do they want to go with a green building or buildings with affordable units in it? To, uh, or mixed use. Or mixed use. Right. To get that bonus. Yes. And so if that's, the, if that's a choice they have, I think I'm okay with that. Yes. It wouldn't change the fact that they have a choice of compliance paths for the bonus. Because then they're not going to just build on it. It's not going to be... You know, I got two here, got two here, here. Correct. It's not cumulative. It's yep. or. That's, that was the intent of the uh, working group, that all these bonuses were not uh, cumulative and they can choose. Do we want to say LEED Gold Certified or better? Or at least LEED Gold Certified? Uh, we can say yeah. minimum lead, LEED Gold Certified. That's it, right? This is gold or better, right? Minimum. Well, I'm kind of changing the whole thing. Oh. So if we say that it's minimum lead gold certified or equivalent level of uh, okay. alternative green building standard. Fine. Okay. Uh, that is a question um, that just came up in my mind. Under bonuses, are we explicit? 
where are we explicit that these are not cumulative? Um, I just e want to make e sure. Four. Uh, we had something there. Uh, Shall not exceed six stories. Okay, but thank you. As long as you're thank there. You. I just wanted to double check. As, you're, as long as you're on that paragraph. Yes. Okay, <coughs> Sanjay, did you want to make a clarification? I think they are not cumulative past six stories. Yes. So you could do one story of affordable right. and one That's story of um, well, whatever you've just decided on. Yep. <laughs> um, so that is cumulative but not yes. beyond six. Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you. Is I appreciate that clarification because I did not state that properly before. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, as long as you're looking that sentence, yes. we should delete and four stories 46 feet in the NMF because there are no bonuses in the NMF. So we don't need, we don't need that part yes. of that sentence. We haven't gotten there yet. No, no, but as long as we're on this. No, but. You just you guys brought it down to three stories. We never got the discussion about bonuses on on, on that to uh, to add another okay. floor. Okay. So you're assuming that three floors is the maximum, right? And we haven't talked about that yet. So I like. Okay. I didn't have that on my list, but I will add it, Ken, to talk okay, about sure. the right. bonuses. Right. Discuss that, okay? Okay. Sorry. Okay. So I will add in discuss. Bonuses for NMF. Okay. Uh, so we'll come back to that one. The next one I had was adding to the purpose statement, um, in, uh, encourage environmental and environmental and climate protection sensitive development. Any concerns with that in section 5.9.2? I looked at it and there was nothing about environment or climate, and yet this has solar, it has trees, it has LEED Gold certified or similar. So I thought it would be nice to put in that one of the purposes are not to require, but to encourage um, um, environmental and climate protection sensitive development. A lot of these Any are concerns? encouraged. Already. No concerns, Madam Chair. Uh, Ken? No. Okay. All right. Uh, the next is uh, about uh, front yard setbacks and extra stories relative to um, the multifamily. Is there something buzzing? Um, should we restrict? Uh, this is where we were going to discuss um, restaurant and retail or serve, defining the types of businesses that we would accept uh, in the first uh, floor of these, well, or excuse me, require in the first floor of these multifamily or these um, mixed use buildings, um, perhaps restrict residences on the first floor in mixed use buildings and whether or not 60% was a high enough um, requirement for the business use. So I'll open it up to Ken. Well, as you well, it, when we do no residence on the first floor uh, in a mixed use building, that automatically makes that building an elevator building because you no you no longer can put a handicap unit on the first floor and say that this meets ADA. So if we if we ex exclude residents on the first floor, now you. Now you include elevators in the building, no matter what size. Um, so when we do say that, then that, that, that comes back to elevated buildings again, where we say that elevators uh, are uh, not a code requirement, it's just an industry standard for four, four stories and up. Could I suggest that perhaps we identify no residences on the first floor for uh, buildings over four stories? Um, and this if they is, take the bonus. And, and this is only for mixed-use buildings, right? Correct. This is, if, this is only to get the bonus. You can't get the bonus for commercial on the ground floor if you have re a residential unit 
on the ground floor. That's true. We're already only talking about buildings over four stories. This is only related well, to mixed use. Well, at least four stories. Right. Right. So if you're going to get the bonus, you can't have a residence on the ground floor because we're trying to reserve as much of the ground floor as possible for some sort of commercial yet to be defined space. So I don't, what we don't want is somebody to put a residence on the ground floor. Unless they're just going to do like a three or four story building without the bonuses, then they can do it. Okay. Okay, so we're aligned with no residence. For, again, this is for the mixed use, for the um, extra stories for mixed use. No residences on the first floor. Um, question around restricting the business uses. Steve, you had mentioned that there was originally some language uh, yes. that the working group was looking at for this. Uh, so yes, um, allowing that mixed use in the Mass Ave Broadway multifamily district would allow commercial uses, would allow commer the commercial uses allowed in the B2 district. Okay. What are those? To go to the table of uses. I don't think I ever saw a draft with that in it, so we'll need to take a look no, at what that is. I. No, there was never in the draft. Okay, so that's, that includes offices allowed by special permit or allowed by right? Well, they're all, well, there's some. I mean, I would imagine this is this is one detail that was not laid de, lit, not nailed down, but I, I think B two allowed by right, so that would be things like smaller rest, restaurants under three thousand square feet, fast food under fifteen hundred square feet, uh, under three thousand square feet of retail, um, under a thousand square feet of manufacturing, um, and so on. And it does include it does include offices. Uh, yes, it does. But Steve, what happens if it's a restaurant greater than 3,000 square feet? Right, that's where it's, yeah, that's a challenging that, that would, that, that would be, it would basically mean you're not going to put it there. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. to me. In fact, a, lo a lot of the things in B2, I think that are, as of right, are not things where we would necessarily say, oh yeah, there's no need for a setback mm -hmm. because of those. I'm looking for things where the advantage of pulling it up to the street and mm -hmm. not having the setback is sort of the pedestrian experience. So that's clearly going to be, you know, things like retail stores right. and restaurants and maybe some service businesses. I'm not sure, but if it's just an office, there's no reason an office can't be set back 15 mm -hmm. feet. Mm -hmm. If it's a bank, I think a bank can be set back 15 feet. You know, so I'm not quite sure where to draw the line other than retail and restaurants. I know which side of the line retail and restaurants go on, in my view of this. I don't know what else goes on that side of the line. Business services was one that you yeah, how, originally would you, right, identified. How, how would we define business? So the, in the, in the um, table of uses, that's defined as copy centers, print shops, banks. Yeah, see, banks, I don't think we know. Uh, hair, laundry, dry cleaning, um, veterinarian, animal care. I'm actually fine with having those come up all the way to the street. Same here. It's, it adds, I would agree. It adds to the... Uh, on the the street life there, you know, having it um, pulled back, it just, it just, now you're holding back businesses because. Um, it, it's real, I think it's really a trade between having some green space in front of a building and the advantage of pulling buildings up to the sidewalk for, you know, pedestrians having, being right there, and I can see it for retail stores, I can see it for restaurants, I can't, I can't see it for offices, 
I can't see it for banks particularly, but if you all think banks fit in there. I think business services do, and banks are part of that category. So we could say. Restaurant, uh, I'm gonna be consistent with the way that they're defined. Eating and drinking establishments, retail, and uh, business services. Okay. I mean, the other use that we should consider, and again, um, it would be a benefit to, we have daycare uses that have, um, that are important to the residents of these buildings and which we know we're underserved of in Arlington. And I have to see what category those fall under. But that's something we should discuss mm -hmm. as well. No, uh, I th I'm, I'm fine with the categories that you propose, and I, I do agree with uh, with that's daycare, family, child care. Yeah. That's under accessory uses. Mm -hmm. Say that again. Accessory. Uh, no, family, child care is that's the that's the um, home care, correct? Claire, do you? Yeah, based on the footnote, it is home, uh, home, home child care. care. Yep, yep. Well, it, I, I can find where, where it is, but do we agree that that's one that we should allow yes. as well? Gene? Sure. Okay. I think we should allow all businesses, but it's fine. Just keep, I, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to finish everything tonight. Well, we don't really have a choice, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so eating and drinking. Eating and drinking, business services, childcare. We include offices, right? And retail. No. Nope. So no, not offices. We're excluding offices? Mm -hmm. Yes. They can have it on the first floor. They just don't get the 15 feet or the bonus mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, I think you're just adding more criteria to not discouraging having any more stuff there. I mean... Well, we're yeah, just... This is... If we want to... Uh, uh, encourage business and housing, let's encourage it. When you put all this burden on it, you don't get it. And if you want to do more green space, then let's talk about green space and, and, and have that a separate discussion. But you put the green space burden on uh, this right here, it's, I think it's unfair. If you want to do green space, put it in the parking lot, uh, put it in or the car parks, and, and, and make it a, uh, where it's like 10 feet wide. It's part of the sidewalk process. Put it. I mean, but you, you keep on adding things to this the, thing here. The, the way I look at this is right now, the rule is 15 foot setback unless you meet certain requirements. And the question is, which of those certain requirements allow you to not, allow you to not have to do the 15 foot setback? 
So the 15-foot setback is the baseline. Mm -hmm. It's already there. So we're talking about which ones can you have on the ground floor that are appropriate enough to pull up to the sidewalk. And we've come up with a lot of them. What's the reason to have offices at the sidewalk level as opposed to walking 15 feet and going into the office? Well, hey, uh, this is a sort of a tangential question. Um, what would we do if someone came in for site plan review and had uh, retail on the first floor, office space on the second, and then three floors of residential? They, they can do that. They it's can do that? Yeah, okay, good. Like this is yeah. only on the ground floor. Well, let's say we had re residential, uh, we had a retail there, okay, and we gave them an exception of, uh, of uh, no setback applied. Ten years down the line, that retail store goes out of business. Now they're only locked in to just do retail. They can't put an office in there. They no, can't. They, they can do retail, eating and drinking establishments, yes, business they, services. Yes, I, I know the list you gave me. But now, now you're limiting to what they can do. They may be empty storefronts. Now we're, we're doing that. And I, I don't know what difference does it make if one or two businesses don't have a green space. You, you, you're just putting more burden on this. That's all I'm saying, okay? And, you know, maybe I'm in a minority here, okay? But you, you, we just keep on adding extra burden on the stuff here that is totally against what we're trying to do here and make it easier for someone to develop more housing. So if you want to do this, you could, it just seems, I don't know, I just seem that uh, I feel like maybe I'm in a minority here, but we're, we're doing that. And, and we're, you know, we're taking less as of right stuff and putting in, oh, well, they have to come by, come by our review. They have to come by this review. They, they, they just, can build a four-story high apartment building right when this passes. Fine. If they want to build up another story or two by putting commercial on the ground floor, they have to understand what type of commercial is allowed and what type is not allowed. I'm in agreement with that for the bonus. Fine here. Okay. Um, the next was the yard and minimum chart, um, Gene. These are just minor, minor things. We need to say minimum <laughs> where it has Front setback, side setback, yep. rear setback. It should probably say front yard setback, side yard setback, rear yard setback minimum. And the, the interesting thing is we got one comment that said um, what you might want to do for the side setback, and it's allowed somewhere in the, in the zone, is say, um, where is it here? A uh, maximum of 20 feet, a minimum of five feet, maximum but at least 20. 20 feet. Right. So I wondered if we wanted to go with that instead of the 20 feet, oh, the side, 10 feet that's here now. The, that gives a little more flexibility to where it goes on the lot, mm -hmm. but you still have a total of 20 feet, and you just have to have a minimum of five. I, I could go either way. I just was interested in what other folks thought about it. Steve? So I had that, I had that uh, on my list of things to um, talk about tonight, but um, Mr. Benson did too, so I let his version take precedence. Okay. Um, I, I agree with it. Um, I believe the member of the public who made that suggestion was motivated by the, fact, by the belief that it would um, reduce the amount of tandem parking required because you could do side by side um, in a 15 foot yard. I'm, I, would, I would like to see us put that provision in. Can you restate that one more time so that I can type that properly? Um, one side minimum five feet, two sides minimum 20 feet. Or you can write it the other way, two sides minimum 20 feet, one side minimum five feet. And we do that just total. for total. And we do, that would just be the side setbacks. And are we referring to this as a corner lot or just a no, plain, any lot? Any lot. And it, and it would just be in the NMF. <clears throat> I 
as it opposed to the straight more, 10. It just gives a little more flexibility about where you're going to place the building on the lot. Well, you say two sides, a minimum of 20 feet, right? Well, right now it's 10 feet on a side. Yes. So what the proposal is, minimum of 20 feet total, minimum of five on either side. So you could have So five two sides has a, has a to total. Equal 20. Okay. Uh, when so I you could do 15 and five or? 10 and 10. Fine. 10 I, 10. When I read this, it didn't, I, I didn't understand it that way. Okay. I just read it as two side minimums of 20 feet. No. It, there's no total in there. <laughs> no, but that's because we have to write it. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, Gene, the next one was a capitalization. Um, I think any Scriveners, yeah, if, I, I if can you are all those. okay with any Scriveners right. Um, right. updates that, that yes. Gene has? Yes, completely yeah. fine. Okay. Yep. Let's a couple. just move on. We have plenty more to cover. Okay, step backs. Step backs. So this proposes um, upper story step backs required on all street frontages. Step back 7.5 feet from the property line starting on the fifth floor. We have proposed fourth floor. Fourth floor, and we have proposed on the principal frontage only, and we have allowed um, cumulative step backs. So by the time you get to the fourth floor, you've stepped back the seven and a half feet. So you could do them on the second floor, you could do them part on the second, part on the third, part on the fourth. My feeling about this is that we should delete this from the development standards and instead put in that it must comply with the step back standards in 5.3.17. So we have a consistent step back standards across town. That's, that's my suggestion for that. Rather than have a slightly different one for I, I think that this makes district. Sense. Makes sense to me. So on a corner lot, um, you pick you, you pick the primary or it would be on Mass Ave? What we wrote, and we'll get to this, what we wrote in our proposal to amend the step back requirements is if you're on Mass Ave or Broadway, Broadway there's a presumption that the principal facade is Mass Ave or Broadway, but when they come to us, ARB, they can say, oh no, that really doesn't work. It's really the side streets, and we can say yes or no. That works fine when it comes to us. Yeah. But they're, they're this is not coming to us. Yes, this yes, is, it, it is. is. They have site to come to site review. plan review. Site plan review. Every one of these is coming to us. Yeah, but a site, site plan, plan review, review, okay, maybe my interpretation is, is incorrect. Site plan review is, is recommendation. It doesn't really carry any weight of. It's this. binding. Claire, correct me if I'm wrong. Site plan review is binding. The ARB does not enforce the uh, site yes, plan review. Yes, site plan review is binding. It's binding. So what we say, the site plan review is binding. So yes. if we say that they need to change this and they change this, it's binding. Yes. I didn't believe that was the interpretation we had at the working group. I, th I thought it was just a recommendation and, they, uh, and it was not binding. It's binding unless it goes beyond what we're allowed to do under the zoning bylaw. Correct. Okay, is that aside? Okay, so if they chose one side as a primary and they do a setback, a step back, sorry, a step back. So the other side does not require a step back. It could just be flush. Right, they can, they can include one but it is not required. If the amendment to town meeting passes, currently it is required. Okay. Steve. Um, since we're on the topic of uh, corners, <laughs> yes. uh, this is a little bit of a jumping back uh, to bonuses in section E1. One of the conditions for uh, ground floor commercial is that 80% of the frontage be occupied by business uses? Yes. Uh, on a corner lot, would that be, is that principal facade only or both facades? Principal facade. Principal. Wouldn't you agree? That's how we've been enforcing that currently. Okay. Okay. 
We haven't discussed yet whether 60% is the right number, though. We have not. Do you have something to, do you have an alternate to propose, Gene, as to 60%? No, just that we, we have discussed whether 60% is the right number, and then we got the letter today from the Chamber of Commerce suggesting 60% was not enough. Madam Chair, I was wondering if um, Mr. Littell had any insight. Please, thank you. Um, I, I think you can adjust it, but our thinking was that it works on both big parcels and smaller parcels. If you had a 10,000 square foot building, that's 6,000 square foot of retail, that's a lot. There's very few establishments that can even fill that. <clears throat> if you have a smaller parcel, let's say your footprint is 3,000 square feet, right? Or 2,000 square feet, um, it would still give you 1,200, but you need space for two means of egress, elevators, lobbies, package room, mechanical. I still think within the 60%, on big projects you're getting a lot, and on smaller projects you're still, it's still realistic. Maximizing, yeah. Thank you, I appreciate it. I also want to add in that uh, bicycle parking on the ground floor is also important. And, you know, if we're trying to uh, enforce or encourage bicycle, um, having it stuffed down the basement or somewhere else is not the way to go. Right, right. So yeah. I think we want to have ample room on the ground floor. I'm not taking away from the retail, but I think I'm comfortable with 60%. Okay. I'm also comfortable with 60%. All right. All right, let's leave it there then. Let's move on. Um, next is, uh, see, we were just starting to talk about section E1. Steve, was that? We just finished that one. We just finished that one, yes. Thank you. Uh, section 5.9.4 D5, traffic, traffic visibility across street corners. Um, so this has to do with Sanjay and my interpretation of, of the draft of the bylaw as opposed to everyone else. So if you look at um, uh, 5.3.12a, which I'll have to find. Thank you. In more way than one. Mm -hmm. But I'm bump. <laughs> what number are we on? 5.9.4 D5. Traffic visibility on street corners does not apply. Gene had a question about this. Do you want us to move on while you find so, that one? No. So here's what it says. Across street corners, between the property lines of intersecting streets and a line joining points on the property lines 20 feet distant from their point of intersection or in the case of a rounded corner, the point of intersection or of their transits, no building or structure in any R district may be erected and no blah, 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 blah. Well, these are not our districts. This is the overlay district. So where the way this is written now for this is, um, does not apply in the MBF district. Well, it doesn't apply in, in either of the districts now because they're not residential districts. So I think what you meant to say but maybe I'm presuming too much, is the traffic visibility across street corners applies in the NMF overlay district, right? Because you just want it to apply to that district and not the MBMF district. So I would just flip around what this says to meet what I think was your intention. So, so you would, su you would suggest that, Gene, that traffic visibility across street corners, applies, section 5.9.4D. 
in the Five. MMF district, MMF overlay Five's district. only in the N. Right. M. I don't believe so, Gene. I know we. I think when we talked about that, we did not say uh, in the surrounding neighborhood districts. We just said that because it, it, it is a multi-use. It's not a residential house. It's not R one or R or, or something like that. Okay, R zero. This is uh, multi-use, and we didn't. And so we may talk about that, and you may want to change that. But that's not what we talked about. But that's what it says right here in your section. It says. It does, it does not apply in the MBMF district, implying well, that it applies in the neighborhood multifamily district. The neighborhood, yeah. We didn't talk about that. That's what I'm telling Looks you. Looks like Sanjay has a clarification. I, I would say this wasn't a, a big point of discussion in the working group. I'm not sure how much we talked about it. But my understanding of the intention there is what Gene is saying, that the, you know, the, the visibility would apply in the neighborhood, right, because that's where we continue to have the setback, right, the, the corner visibility makes sense. It does not make sense to have it apply in the business districts because we don't have it apply in the business districts. And so the same was true for MN, whatever, Mass Ave, um, because the, com the possibility of commercial. So, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So what I said was what the intention was. Yes, I, I, it was Change not a huge... MBMF to yeah. NB, yeah. yes. NMF, okay. yes. Okay. Steve, any... Applies in N, uh, saying that it applies in the N MF. neighborhood multifamily district is fine with me. Okay. Ken? No, nothing. Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, Gene 5.9.4 D8. Um, this is the... This says the height buffer area shall not apply. Um, so we have a height buffer area. It only applies under the rules where you look at the chart and the chart has two heights. We don't have a chart in the overlay district with two heights. So technically, we don't need this in here because it doesn't apply. I think it should apply, though. I think it should apply because we could end up with a six-story high building backing on, you know, a one-story high or a two-story high building with very little space, 20, 25 feet between them. And we intend to change the height buffer, mm -hmm. but either this town meeting I or next town meeting. I don't think we right. can do it this town meeting, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to, to that. that one. Yeah. We'll get to that. So I would prefer to keep, to instead say the height buffer area does apply to six-story buildings in the overlay district. So the, so it would, if, if written out in conventional two-height form, it would be six and five. Or five and six, if, yeah. As, and that, that's fine. So you're saying it only applies to six-story buildings? Well, Steve suggested five and six. Well, no. So the the height buffer would apply to the sixth floor, but not the fifth floor. Sixth floor, yeah. So essentially, a six-story building. Yeah. Now I know that could be a little bit of a disincentive for somebody to build the sixth floor, and I'm concerned about that. But for me, the overriding thing is we have this height buffer in the regs, in the bylaw already, that affects a lot of the buildings along Mass Ave and Broadway, or theoretically could, once they get above four stories, because that's usually the cutoff, four story mm -hmm. or six story. And I would prefer that we figure out what to do with the height buffer regulate bylaw, rather than jerry-rig something here. That's my feeling, anyhow. And I think, Ken, this also addresses, I know you wanted to circle back to the way that buildings um, address, excuse me, let me speak into the mic. I know that you wanted to address the way that buildings um, interact with a residential parcel behind them. So this would be one vehicle for, for doing that. So six story, so six story building, it applies for a six story building adjacent to a residential building, a residential zone. 
which right that's now, in essence what the yeah. yeah essentially that doesn't happen because uh, we only allow six-story buildings on primary quarters here and adjacent right. neighborhoods are but max that's now of what four stories now or or three stories three I don't know three what stories. Three so, it, it would not, so it'll it, never ha this thing will never happen no it could oh. happen on Mass Ave there are some that do not have um, so that that's up. what I'm saying this this then if, if if there is a residential house on Mass Ave this one this one look at all of these that don't have any neighborhood parcel behind them well, those are on, on, on Broadway, and those are and no Mass longer six-story buildings. And so, Mass Ave. Here, 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 here. That's just in East Arlington. So, in effect, uh, for, for question for Mr. Benson, you would be keeping the buffer areas that are in the bylaw, so 200 foot. Until we fix them. Yeah, 200 foot northerly, 100 foot southerly, and 150 feet on the other two sides. You have a suggestion? The, the problem, let me just, before your suggestion, and, and we'll get to this later, mm -hmm. the problem I have with going from 200 to something else is we don't have any, mm -hmm. how do you get to something else? Yeah, we can, we can talk about that when yeah, we get to right. whatever article that right. is, yes. Right. Okay. Well, well, um. Okay. 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 Uh, the next was the underlying district versus the, well, we already talked about that, the overlay district. Um, Ken, you wanted to talk about how we turn the corner on step backs. Yep. What would you like to discuss there? Well, on a corner lot, Two sides are considered fronts. One's primary, one's secondary. And then the, the other two, the other two sides of the property are considered side side uh, side yard setbacks. There, on a corner lot, there are no rear lot rear setback. So when you turn a, turn the corner from primary to a, to a secondary uh, front yard, and then that goes along. It, the setback on that side at the end of that road is only five feet. And it's, let's say if, if it's uh, residential, I mean, sorry, if it's commercial and it happens to be retail or whatever that fits in your category there, there's a zero lot setback there. So that comes out all the way to, to the front there and then it's a five yard setback. Uh, uh, yeah, setback. And then there might be a residential house or a two family house or a three family house on the next property over. So that's where the reduced height buffer applies. That's Correct. where my question is right now, because if, if that's the case, then, then, it's, then you're gonna, if it's 100 feet, you know, now that pushes that building way up the other side, and now you're f pretty far Which away. Which is why we need to fix the reduced height buffer. Yes, zone. but that's limiting what we're trying to do here on the MBTA. I completely understand. So w regarding, regarding corner lots, um, the definition for the bylaw, our bylaw granted does not make this easy to understand. Correct. The definition for lot line rear um, you know, goes on to say that in the case of a corner lot, the owner shall have the option of choosing which of the two lot lines that are not front lot lines is to be considered a rear lot, lot line. So I read it as you have two fronts, you get to pick what the rear is, and, you, and then the rest of the side. Now it's a little messier when you have three fronts. In that case, you have the rear is a side and you're, there is no rear. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that, is that... That's what it says? That's, that's what it says, yes. All right, I, I, I thought I interpreted it differently. I, if I did, then that's... Good? Yeah, well, we just table that. It's, okay. They just. Um... All right. Um, section E2, there was the. Um, where was the word additional, Steve, that needed to be added? Uh, 
So the, it was actually after the word additional. Story. The word Second story. additional. One additional story. Yes. Right. I'm sorry. Where, I, I, I'm. It may just be that I'm tired. Where Where does right. it, right. show me where this needs to go? In. Additional. Story. Thank you very much. Okay, it's the second additional. I was looking at the first. Thank you. Add story after second additional. Okay. And uh, let me see, F1 and F4 we already addressed. Uh, just to confirm how mm -hmm. it came out. So since we settled on a minimum parking of one space and TDM, mm -hmm. um, I think we keep four. You know, I, I think F4 is the one that we keep. Um, but in F1, the last sentence for business use is no off-street parking is required for the non-residential space. I think we keep that part two. And then we can strike the first two lines of F1. And again, we're, we're right editing that to say developments under this section are encouraged to provide fewer parking spaces right. than what is required under the provisions of section 1.6.1.5. 1. 6. 6. 1. 1. No, 6.1. 6.1.5 6. 1. 1. is the parking reduction. You just want to And we need 6. both 1. because one is the minimum and one is the reduction. We need four and one. You and just why need, are we getting rid of two? You just need to say 6.1. We didn't talk about that. Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. I, when I, I said get removing the first two lines of oh. F1, not removing, F2 is perfectly fine. We, we should keep that. <laughs> well, okay, we haven't so, talked about it, but yeah, at least one. Okay. So, six, so we're removing the first two lines of one. We're replacing those with the requirement to follow 6.1 mm -hmm. and adding to it the uh, number four. So basically condensing one and four into a single. That's fine. Okay. Um, and then Ken wanted to add in discussing bonuses for the neighborhood multifamily. We're doing that, right? Uh, it's not in here currently. It's, unless I missed. It, it's it's not, hasn't you know, been in there. The bonuses not, have only no bonus been. For the, on Broadway and SF. So there's no bonus in, uh, in uh, Broadway right now? No, yeah. there is bonus on Broadway and Mass Ave. There's no bonus in the neighborhood multifamily district. Okay, yep, you're correct. I'm sorry. Okay, we're good. All right, so that brings us, any, anything else on Article 12? Nothing here. Ken? No. Um, so we're, we're going to go, and I don't mind approving it in a whole, but there's certain sections that I'm going to object to. I understand. And we'll leave it at that. Understand. Okay. So what I will do is run through the list of uh, changes that I have he written down here. If I miss any, please, um, please let me know. I will can. Identify those which you do not agree with, if that works for you. Yes. Um, and again, uh, just raise your hand or let me know if I if I miss one or if I mischaracterize one, please. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so the modifications, so I'm going to phrase this in the form of a motion so that I don't have to restate this yet again. <laughs> Is there a motion to... Uh, Recommend favorable action on Article 12, MBTA Communities Overlay District with the following amendments. Reduce the um, NMF max height to three stories, knowing that Ken is not um, dissents on this one. Three stories and 36 feet. Thank you. 36 feet or 35? What, what, is, what is it? 
the, the current regs are 35. All right, 35. 35. Thank you. Apply current off-street parking requirements of 6.1, including reductions per 6.15, with Ken in um, Ken as dissenting. Uh, we also discussed, although this will not be in the, um, well, I'll not put that in the motion. Um, we will combine, uh, F one and four into a single item under off, off street parking under height options. We are going to accept uh, alternate two as proposed for the Arlington Heights section of the map. I thought it was two A or something like that, wasn't it? I think there were only two options. I think it was one and two, but you please could, correct could be, me if I'm wrong. You could be right. I believe it's, we ha yeah, they're labeled alternative one and alternative two. There's an alternative one, and then alternative two. There's no two A. Uh, sorry, I got it all. Sheets. That's okay. Confused. I'm sorry, Claire. You said there was a two and a two A. No, no. I'm sorry. Just There's two. Just two. Okay, so we're good on alternative two. Correct. Okay. Um, we are modifying. We are accepting alternative. 3A for Mass Ave. Scenario 3A. Scenario, thank you. Three A uh, to exclude parcels on Mass Ave from or Orvis to Alewife Brook Parkway, with the exception, um, with the additional um, modification of. Uh, including one additional parcel in the uh, NMF district on the north side from Winter to Henderson and on the south side from Lake to Fairmont. And I'm rejecting that. Okay. And with the removal of, um, can I see that map that I marked up? Want to just count the number of parcels? Oh. Uh, okay. Here. With the removal of three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, eight small parcels uh, identified on the map exhibit. You keep that. Thank you. Uh, Okay. I'm a no on that too. I've got you no on the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. So the next item is um, we are accepting Jean's recommendation for modifications to section 5.9.1C with regard to um, how to deal with projects in and out of the overlay district and adding for the, that was for the second sentence. Right. In the first sentence, we are adding um, for a maximum of one parcel depth into the NMF. Yep. And Ken, you are not in agreement on that one either, correct? No, I was. In, I changed my mind when you said that one parcel. Okay. Is allowed to go one okay. parcel. Okay, great. Um, the next item we are doing is um, we are not going to be adding the street trees. That's going. To, we're going to be addressing that in Article Ten. Um, and, and yeah, we can come back if we can come back and amend this vote if we need to. Right. Uh, the next item is we are adding 
section 6.4 to apply to the MBMF for the solar roof requirements. And can you are in support or not in support of that one? I'm not in support of that one. Okay. Just because it's the same as the trees. Solar roof requirement in the MBMF. Yes, that's what I have. Thank you. Uh, for signs, we are adding requirements uh, for the NMF to comply with the residential sign district as per section 6.4, no, 6. Well, signs are 6.2. 6.2, thank you. And, and then I gave you which ones go, yes. which ones go in each district, thank NMF you. residential. And, and the then the MBMF residential is the residential slash business sign district. The MBMF mixed use is re, uh, the business sign district. Okay. Thumbs up. Uh, for the, we're modifying the bonus relative to uh, green building requirements to read that a minimum of LEED gold certified or equivalent level of alternate green building standard as reviewed and approved by the redevelopment board is the uh, bonus requirement related to green building standards. We are adding the to the purpose statement 5.9.2 to add, uh, to encourage environmental and climate protection sensitive development. In section 5.9.4.10, we are removing the first sentence and moving the second and third sentences to the district chart in number 12. We are also removing the word public from the descriptor of art. We are uh, adding the provision in the uh, mixed use bonus provision that uh, for the additional two floors, no residences shall um, be included on the first floor and that uh, the uh, business uses shall be eating and drinking establishments, business services, child care, and retail. Noting that Ken is in dissent on this one. Yes. Thank you. For the yard and minimums chart on 5.9.4 D12, we are adding minimum, the word minimum to front side and uh, rear setbacks. And did you want to add yard? Yeah, yard. And add the word yard. We are also updating the um, side yard setbacks for the NMF to indicate that where there is one side yard, the minimum is five feet. Um, and with the two side, or excuse me, for um, the NMF, uh, the total is 20 feet. 20 feet for the uh, side setbacks with a minimum of five feet on, on one side. Or, or one side minimum of five feet, two sides minimum 20 feet total. Yes, Yes. correct. <laughs> uh, We're adding some Scrivener's notes with regard to capitalization yep. in sections 5.9 and uh, 5.93. We are uh, adding the requirement to comply with step back standards in 5.3.17. We are uh, uh, correcting 5.9.4 D5 traffic visibility to indicate that it applies to the NMF district, not the MBMF district. Apply, uh, applies only to the- Only in the NMF district, district, yes. District. Correct. In section 5.9.4 D8, we are identifying that the height buffer area shall apply uh, to the sixth floor. And Ken, you are not in agreement with that one, correct? No, I'm okay. You're okay with floor. that one? Yep. Okay. Um, and in section E2, we are adding story after the additional, or after the second uh, word additional. Did I miss anything? No, I just want to ask Claire something. Are you okay? Steve? Uh, I think you've covered it. Okay. Ken? I'm just asking Claire a question. Yeah, yeah of course. We'll hold and then I will ask for mm -hmm. someone to make the motion. Uh, 
that's fine. She said that's fine. Okay. okay. Um, so do I hear uh, someone to make that motion for uh, favorable action with the previously stated amendments for um, Article 12? I'll so move. Is there a second? Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Jean. Yes. Ken? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we, Redevelopment Board has recommended favorable action with uh, stated amendments for Article 12. Okay, nine more to go. Let's head over to Article 3. By the way, thank you all. I know that that was a lot to get through. Um, I appreciate everybody working so hard to get through all of these this evening. So you thank you. You too, Rachel. Thank you. Okay. Apologize for my stubbornness. <laughs> you know, it's, it's important that we feel like we can all express our um, opinions freely and honestly and respect each other's point of views. So I appreciate you bringing those up, Ken. Okay, excuse me one second while I pull this up. You don't want me to go through these? That would be great. It should hopefully three, be faster. Article three was the exact same as last time. It just um, corrects a reference. Should we vote on these individually? Yes, we're gonna vote on them individually. Um, Ken, any questions on article three? No. Uh, Steve? No questions. Is there a motion to recommend favorable action for article three? So moved. Second? Second. We'll take a vote starting with Jean. Yes. Ken? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We have recommended favorable action of a vote of four to zero for Article 3. Next is Article 4. All right, so when we last saw Article 4, there was a Scrivener's error and the wrong warrant article wording was there. So we thought we couldn't do anything. This has the correct warrant article wording um, that was presented. Um, I didn't make any change in the reduced height buffer area. Um, so that wording is the same as it carried over from last year sometime. My feeling about it is that because the article wording says we'll vote to update to define finding, it's not within the scope to change the height distances here. And I don't know how we would determine what a better height distance is without some discussion and, and looking at what the options are. So that would be my first thing. I don't think it's within the scope to change the height. And we haven't had a discussion about how to change the height. Then my second is, I don't see how the new wording is particularly better than the old wording. I'd prefer to do no action and go back to town meeting with a complete package that includes new wording if we want any and lower heights. So that's where I am on this. Steve? Yeah, um, in terms of in terms of heights, or in terms of the actual buffer areas, uh, the best suggestion I could do is note that you know the heights were maximum heights were larger when this was written, and just simply scale the triangle down. Um, I agree that it would be worthwhile to actually spend time looking at it. So I, I'm I'm inclined not to want to do too much, do anything with it this year. Ken, same here. Great, and I agree. I, I think we we did take a look at this, uh, we had not yet come to consensus. We had several different options that we were considering, and I think that um, taking a little bit more time to review those uh, together would be helpful. So is there a uh, motion to recommend no action on Article 4? So moved. Second. Take a vote, starting with Jean. Yes. Ken. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Uh, let's move to Article 5. Article 5, if you look at the definitions, the only thing I changed was the underlying wording that starts with the word except um, to make it clear that the change only applied in the business districts, because that's what we had talked about doing and was in the warrant. Um, the other 
Um, let me see if there's anything else that I changed. You scratched out Section D. Well, we I'd scratched out Section D before. Section D um, was unnecessary because I wrote, I slightly rewrote Section C. Um, so it says, in all districts except the business districts are calculated on gross floor area for business districts, see the note. If you look at the note at the end of um, B5, you would delete the word and in the second line after the word space. That was an error. And that's the note. So those are the changes since we saw it last time. Great. Any discussion? Steve? Uh, yes, I have one request and one concern. Okay. So as far as a request go, uh, we, for context, I would suggest including the definition of open space, you know, in addition to the ones for landscaped and usable. Uh, my reasoning is that, and I'm saying this as a town meeting member, I don't, I don't believe I feel like town meeting doesn't quite have its head around open space as defined in our bylaw. And we saw some of that in the comments where you know people would assume it would meant public space or it meant green space. And it's a defined term in the bylaw. It means something completely different. So yeah, my first suggestion is to include the definition of open space for context. My second, um, my one concern, my concern is that the um, the topic of balconies and rooftops is especially uh, not well understood by town meeting. And I was wondering how members of the board felt about leaving the definitions as they are and just making the dimensional changes. Uh, Ken. I don't know. That's, uh, you got me there. I did not know that that was going to come up. <laughs> uh, I do agree with you. Uh, we need to do better explaining what we mean by open space or what open space means, not what we mean. At the last meeting, people were, were thinking that uh, that open space allowed uh, cars to park in the backyard and so, so forth like that, and I don't believe that's the case. Uh, it was made fairly clear by the uh, building commissioner that they uh, uh, Parking a car in the backyard has different regulations. It's under the driveways, uh, zoning ordinance, not this. So I think making it much, much clearer is the way to go. And if we can't do that for this article here, it's going to end up like what happened uh, at the last meeting. So uh, my question is, if, can we get something to better define this? Or otherwise, let's uh, table it for the next meeting. Because be, we'll be bringing up the same stuff again, and I think the result will be the same. Gene? I, th I think it's a good idea to add the definition of open space here. I mean, we're not going to amend it, but just right. to add it to give some more context. I, I don't understand what you're proposing, Steve, if we take the accept pieces out of the definitions. Where would you put them to have the same effect? So, in, in other words, I'm proposing that we not change that part. So, in, I, I, I know you, are, I don't agree with the uh, ten, no more than 10 feet above any limited or any, you know, the lowest occupied story for residential use. But um, my concern is I, I've seen town meeting get kind of caught up on that, um, or it's been a point of, you know, uh, it's been, it's been a point of surprise where you know you where they'll see this and they'll say we why are we allowing it on why are we allowing open space on balconies well it, it's been in the bylaw for the last 50 years they, but this is not something that's well understood so if we took those out the only thing that this would do is change how you calculate the dimensional requirements in the business districts to be based on lot area yeah, so uh, I believe that, um, so section D, which is uh, marked as strike out, would stay struck out. And um, yes, right. we and would be changing the, the way that right. the, the we, dimensional is calculated. Yeah, so we, we keep D struck out, we'd, we'd amend C, and then we'd add the note at the end mm -hmm. of the 
Um, that's been a huge challenge for us, though, dealing with this 10 foot. I mean, to me, that's, mm -hmm. that's the most important part of this entire right. thing that well, we're doing in some ways. Well, there is, I'm raising it as a point of concern. I, I understand. You know, I'm, it's not something that we're, I would not oppose the definition changes that are suggested. Jean. I agree it's a, it's a, it's something that, well, let me just preface it by saying quite a number of the comments that I got, and I think all of us got, on MBTA communities either said directly or implied that they thought that open space was not open space owned by the owner of the property, but public open space. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I have a 15 yard setback on my front yard, it's public space according to what quite a number of people said. And so their concern about the setbacks were, well, I won't have access to that space anymore. So I know that's a problem and I know it's difficult, and I know this has come up before. I just sort of feel like, um, and I know this, this will require two-thirds vote mm -hmm. to pass town meeting. I feel like we can make a good case about why this makes a lot of sense. And maybe we can even find for the, for the um, display about this, pictures of a couple of those buildings you can see in Europe that have greenery all over the front coming off the balconies, you know, because people look at those and say, wow, that's great. Or, you know, look at like the Biophilic Cities website and it's full of a lot of that. So I agree with you, Steve, but I guess I feel like, how long are we gonna be gun shy about this? Okay. No, so that's fair. That's I think we need I to have the conversation. Yeah. As long as, it, although it's not readily apparent from uh, the draft amendment, you know, but when we do the final report, I hope that it clearly shows that, you know, the text about uh, rooftops and balconies is in the bylaw <laughs> because it's, it's, it's there. <laughs> that it's already there, yes. Yes, that it is already clear. there. Yeah, I mean, if people read this, they would, they would see that, but mm -hmm. yeah. I think that the other thing to um, ensure that it is highlighted is that the percentage of landscaped open space is increasing in the table um, in terms of what is proposed for open space. Yes, it is. And um, for some, not all. For some, for yeah. the for the mixed use properties, right? right. Which makes a lot of sense because that is actual green space as opposed to usable open space, which has no requirement no, right. that it be planted or have any type of um, yeah. any type of greenery whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a net positive specifically in the mixed use um, in the mixed use properties. It could be a paved tennis court. It could be, yes. That's what the bylaw says. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any other changes or discussion on this item? I, I, think, I think Steve highlighted how important it will be for us to get this right as we present it to town meeting. So um, I can share that I, this weekend, put together a list of, of potential graphics that I thought would be helpful. And in, in this one specifically, I think, um, illustrating how, unfortunately, with usable open space tied to the building square footage, how that increases as the building height increases, as opposed to being tied to the lot line, actually um, reduces the percentage of commercial space that we can have on the, you know, less than four percent of, you know, space that's devoted to business districts in the town, um, and that again by increasing the landscape open space, we're actually we can visually show that we are increasing the amount of um, space devoted to 
that is specifically identified mm -hmm. to be devoted to green space um, as opposed to usable open space, which has no explicit requirement for that. So if you are in agreement that those illustrations are helpful, that's what I had suggested. Okay. Is there a motion to, um, to uh, is there a motion for uh, favor, to vote for favorable action for Article 5? With adding the definition of open with, space. Thank you. The with the um, amendment of uh, adding the definition of open space. I will so move. Is there a second? Second. Uh, we'll take a vote starting with Jean. Yes. Ken? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So we will vote favorable action on Article 5, 4 to 0. Excuse me, did I say 4 to 0? 4 to 0. Okay, Article 6. Rear yard setbacks, I didn't make any change from the last time um, we saw it. it. It just changes it from a, from a formula to an amount depending on what's behind it. Uh, Ken, any thoughts? No comments. Steve? Nothing here. Okay. Um, sorry, let me get to that. Too many windows open, I apologize. Right, and so again, because we need to put this into the board report here, this is really around the, um, the simplification and the, um, the uh, application of the setback, excuse me, based on, let me find my notes here, uh, the distance of, off of the parcel behind the lot rather than the length of the parallel wall. Well, the, right, both the, the distance and the height of the building. Correct. Uh, yeah, so it, yes. it's much saner than yes. it was before. Exactly, more, <laughs> more predictable and to Ken's point, um, understandable and, uh, and uh, again, predictable in terms of the... Um, I would also yeah, add context sensitive. Context sensitive, yep. thank yes. you. That's exactly the right phrase. Great. Is there a motion to uh, for to vote favorable action for to recommend favorable action for uh, Article Six? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Take a vote, starting with Ken. Uh, Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We will recommend favorable action for Article Six. Article Seven. Seven. All right. So. Um, I did make a change in this. When we had the discussion last time, Ken wanted to keep um, the setback on the fifth floor. Steve and Rachel and I thought it should be on the first floor, on the fourth floor, excuse me. So I moved it to um, the fourth floor, and that's the only change that I made in this. So it now says in, for buildings in excess of three stories in height, this step back provides on the fourth floor. Rest of the same principal facade, presumed can be changed by us. Um, I added what Steve suggested, step back requirements shall not apply to buildings in the industrial zones. And um, that's it. Great, any discussion starting with Ken? I'm gonna uh, vote no for this. Uh, do you wanna talk about? I still believe that um, the setback should be on the fifth floor, not the fourth floor. Okay, uh, Steve. Uh, nothing further here. Uh, nothing here. Uh, and I am also uh, in support of this one. Uh, we'll take. Is there a motion to recommend favorable action for Article Seven? So moved. Is there a second? Second. We'll take a vote, starting with Jean. Yes. Ken. No. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes is one, so we will recommend favorable action with a vote of three to one. I, I think it's important in the report that it's made clear that the no vote wanted a higher, 
Yes, I have that, that in my notes here. As so, opposed to the other reasons. Yep, Claire, we'll just need to make sure yeah. we note that in the. We don't have to say it was kin, but. <laughs> no, we just, yeah, typically we just identify yeah, the. Yeah. Right. All right, uh, Article 8. No changes from the last time we saw it. And this is height and story minimums. Uh, Steve. So I, I recall seeing an earlier version where there were dimensional tables involved and it looks like we're just uh, putting in a paragraph rather. Uh, yeah, after going through the dimensional tables, I said to myself, this is crazy. We just need to put this in, in this particular section. I, I think that's a, that's a, a nice way to do it. <laughs> just wanted to make sure there was nothing missing. <laughs> no, nothing missing. That, that disappeared the previous time. Yeah. Great. Ken? I'm supportive of this. I am all. I think that it's important that we, um, again, are driving home the fact that in, again, the less than 4% <laughs> of land that is zoned for business, that we're incentivizing a more um, intensive and um, valuable land use on these properties. Yep. Yeah, I, Anything I'm, else to add? I was going to say, I, I am also supportive. And yeah, this, uh, to me, this is, you know, the, the motivation behind of this and several of the other articles is to encourage higher value redevelopment that produces more tax revenue for the town uh, and hopefully, ideally, would lead to fewer overrides or smaller overrides. Thank you, Steve. Is there a uh, motion to recommend favorable action for Article 8? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Take a vote, starting with uh, Jean. Yes. Ken. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We are recommending favorable action with a vote of 4 to 0. And Article 9. Uh, there was no change since the last time um, you saw this. As we pointed out last time, we have the authority under a section of the bylaw to modify or waive the, um, the front yard, the corner lot depths. And so this just makes it easier for somebody who's coming in to understand how this works. Thank you. Steve, any comment? Uh, yes, I, I think it's a, um, it is a, an accurate way of codifying the board's interpretation of uh, five three, section 5.3.16. Great. Thank you. Ken? No, I think this ties in with the uh, previous article about uh, adjacent heights of different buildings. Great. Great. Is there a recommendation? Uh, is there a motion to recommend favorable action for Article 9? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Take a vote, starting with Jean. Yes. Ken? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We'll recommend favorable action as a vote of 4 to 0. Okay. Uh, next is street trees. Street trees. All right. The one difference is we're going to add something. <laughs> So it will say, in the business, residential, and multifamily housing overlay district, in the business district, residential district, and multifamily housing overlay district, and then the rest will be the same. And that was, will be the only change from the last time you saw it, except at some point I added the word Arlington in front of the word redevelopment board. Great, thank you, Jean. Uh, Ken, any commentary? Nope, not here. Steve? Yes. Um, I s recall the intent of this oh, being I... to encourage street trees anytime there was redevelopment. And here we're limit limiting it to things under review of R the ARB and the ZBA. So that takes a big chunk of the town out of the picture. All right, so I, I want to answer that, but there was something else I meant to do and I didn't. If you look at administration, it should say section, we can't say section 9X because we don't know if that's going to get passed. And so I think we should say, and site plan review. So even if it doesn't get passed, we still have it in here. So I would change that to site plan review. 
Well, here's the thing. My understanding was, and based on conversations we had from Arlington Green Streets, that we were going to make it a requirement for street trees the same way we did previously for um, um, commercial buildings. But right now, there's a whole, there are some ways that you don't need to put a street tree, like if the street trees are already there, if the utility lines are in the way, et cetera, et cetera. So when it was just the redevelopment board doing it for site plan for EDR, we could, we could do that. But under this, there are going to be times where it's in front of the ZBA, times when it's in front of us, and times when it might be in front of neither of us. Let's say it's just a regular single family house going up somewhere. So the way we attempted to deal with this is if it's in front of the ZBA for some reason, and it could be, then they will determine whether they're going to um, do one of the, um, allow some of the changes. If it's, um, that's, you know, where there's no other suitable thing. If it's, if it's just a single family home that's not subject to um, ARB or ZBA, then the, the um, planning department administratively can make that decision. So, so my concern is in the applicability section. Okay. So uh, we're, I'm reading um, in the business and residential districts and the multifamily overlay district. Right. New construction additions over 50% of the existing footprint or redevelopment subject to review by the Arlington Redevelopment Board or Zoning Board. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just as a, to toss an idea out and please let me know what you think. Um, I'm wondering how, how my colleagues would fear, feel about striking um, the words subject to review by the Arlington Redevelopment Board or Zoning Board of Appeals. So that, you know, it would apply to new construction additions over 50% of the existing footprint or redevelopment. That makes perfect sense to me. Point blank, yeah. yeah. The, fir the, first time I read, the first time I read this, it, um, it took, well, I'll, I'll just say it took several times for, the, for that extra ore to creep in. Or <laughs> yeah, it I seemed like it, was, it, was, it would have uh, excluded things that were just going to inspectional services for a plain old building permit. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm just working through whether there's any scenarios I'm not <laughs> immediately thinking of where um, we could encourage additional tree planting, but that seems to make sense fair. to me. I mean, if you pull yeah. the permit to build a, no, you, you do your to. bathroom, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't, I don't want to right. be planting a tree. Okay, that makes sense. So we will um, strike in 6.3.2 or subject to review by the Arlington Redevelopment Board or the Zoning Board of Appeals. And then in 6.3.3, we'll strike and section 9.x and say, and site plan review. I meant to do that and forgot. Because uh, we don't know if section 9 is going to pass. Yes, I have that one in there too, Jean. Okay. Yeah, site plan review instead of 9.x. Right. Yep, yeah. okay. Is there a motion to recommend favorable action with the proposed amendments? So moved. Is there a second? The bona fide amendment, right? We're going to have to say modified or? Yes, as modified. As modified. Yes. Yeah, she said that. I thought. No, sorry. It's didn't okay. Hear, didn't oh, hear I'll that. say it again. I'll, no, I'll second it. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll take a vote starting with Jean. Yes. Ken. Yes. Uh, Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. It's getting okay. very late for me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Not only you. Favorable action was recommended on street trees. Article 11, uh, residential in the business districts. Gene, take it away. Um, I didn't make any changes from the last time you saw it. If you saw an earlier draft, there might have been tables and tables and tables. But after thinking about it, I realized we only needed to change the use table. 
to make this happen. So that's all we've done. Yeah. And then the district mm -hmm. and purpose. And the reason I changed the purpose, district and purpose is because the purpose is changing. Thank you, Jean. Ken, any questions or comments? We're on. Uh, residential uses in the business districts. Okay, no. Steve? Uh, no questions or comments. And I am also in favor of this article. Uh, is there a motion to uh, recommend favorable action on Article 11? So moved. Is there a second? A second. Uh, we'll take a vote starting with Jean. Yes. Ken. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. We will recommend favorable action for Article 11. All right. In the absence of any other articles, <laughs> that closes agenda item number two. Uh, we'll now go to agenda item number three, which is to review our meeting schedule. Claire, I will hand it over to you. Great. You have Great, thank you. Currently, we are scheduled to meet <clears throat> on October the 10th um, to approve the ARB report um, as I'm sure amended and edited by members of this board. Um, we also are currently scheduled to meet on October the 16th, um, although the chair will not be in attendance at that meeting. Um, the question is, is whether or not the board um, would like to meet on Monday, October 23rd, which would be uh, prior to town meeting. We've done this in the past where we've met um, in the conference room for about an hour um, before uh, town meeting and then adjourned to town meeting. Um, if that is something the board wishes to do on the 23rd, we can um, um, schedule, I can certainly schedule um, some uh, items uh, for an agenda. Um, if the board does not wish to meet on that day, that is perfectly fine too. <clears throat> Kim? I would like to keep the meeting on October 23rd. Um, just schedule this so that if we need to do some talking points prior to town meeting, we, we have the ability to do so and make any, you know, little last, last minute tweaks just as a precursor for the meeting. I'll actually just add to that before I go to my colleagues. Um, now that you've brought that up, one of the things, um, if there are amendments, um, for example, that are proposed for articles we have not yet heard, we have often found it helpful to be able to um, have a discussion and um, thoughtfully weigh in on um, support or um, reservations we might have about some of the proposed amendments. So I, I would agree with, with Ken in, in thinking about it in that terms, it, it makes some sense to keep it on in case we need it. But Great, Steve, sounds good. Steve, Thank any you. thoughts on that? No, I, I agree that it's useful to uh, have a meeting scheduled before town meeting to tie up loose ends and um, talk about things that need discussion. Jean? Agree. Okay. If we could be in that little room in Annex. Yeah, yeah. we can meet in the DPCD conference room. Right, then we don't have to walk far. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions on uh, <coughs> agenda item number three, which is the meeting schedule? Ready for number four. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> so a motion. Okay. Can I, just, oh, can I just say something yes. before we adjourn? Please. I know there are only like maybe two people here or three, four people here from the working group. I just want to say that I think you guys did terrific work. I really appreciate all the time and effort and, and the report, which was just wonderful. I know we made some changes to what you recommended, but I know you understood that that was part of this iterative process that we're going through. So, you know, I just wanted to say thanks to, and to you too. Thank you. Who, who were involved the whole, in this. The whole department yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for all the work. Yeah. And also to the members of the public, we received a lot of outreach. It was all read, every single word. Everyone. And we really yeah. appreciate it all. Before we um, take a motion to adjourn, um, I would like to offer to do another um, sort of like build out analysis, similar mm -hmm. to what. Um, you know what I provide what once we once we have a new compliance model yes um, if that would be useful for reporting and it's I, I could turn that around fairly quickly quickly once once I have the spreadsheets that would be fantastic Steve, okay thank you 
Well, then I, my offer stands. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any other um, items before we adjourn? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So motioned. Is there a second? second? We'll take a vote starting with Jean. Yes. Ken. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you all. This meeting is adjourned.